Good evening. I'd like to call the Planning Commission for March Recording in 28th progress. to order. If we could um, rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Commissioner Balma, would you lead us? Thank you. Uh, city planner, can you do roll call, please? Uh, Chairman Rosales. Present. Commissioner Balma. Present. Commissioner Custer. Here. Commissioner Simons. Here. Commissioner Morrissey. Here. Commissioner Hayes. Here. Commissioner Dodds. Present. Let the record show that uh, all seven members of the Planning Commission are present. Thank you. And with that, I'd like to welcome uh, two new commissioners to the, uh, the Planning Commissioner, uh, Planning Commission, Jeff Simons to my left here, and then uh, Kevin Dodds to the far right over here. Welcome. You're in for a wild ride. <laughs> Okay, communications on matters not on tonight's agenda. Anything, uh, City Planner? Uh, Chairman Rosales, we have one request to speak on an item that's not on the agenda. Okay. The individual could come forward. Arlene Hammerschmidt. I just wanted, Arlene Hammerschmidt. Um, Ruralish Fire Mountain in Oceanside. I just wanted to say welcome to the new members to of this planning commission. Um, and that's it. Let's start the night off on a positive. Thank you very much. Have a good one. Thank you, Arlene. Okay, approval of minutes from our last uh, meeting, uh, March 14th. Any edits, comments by commissioners that were present that evening? Do we have voting on screen tonight? We do. Okay. Okay. So we will, uh, I'll ask for uh, a motion first for approval of the minutes. Oh, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. And a second? A second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Don't see any requests. So let's go ahead and vote. And for the new commissioners, I think you would abstain on this one. Commissioner Rosales, let the uh, record show that five in favor and two abstentions on the minutes for the meeting of March 14th. Great, thank you. Um, I don't see anything listed on tonight's consent calendar nor transportation items, so we'll go right to public hearings. Item four is consideration of a regular coastal permit mm -hmm. to allow revetment repairs on existing properties along South Pacific Street. Um, Applicant in this case is uh, Mark J. Dillon. So we'll start with disclosures. Um, I read the staff report and I believe we all received several emails on this item. Uh, Commissioner Dodd? Kevin? Uh, dis Disclosures. So, any anything you have to disclose on this item, it can be as simple as staff report, or you visited a site, or anything else. I, I did talk to um, general public, some people in general public, on this. Thank you, Commissioner Obama. Staff reports, uh, e lots of emails, and uh, did a Google map look. Uh, uh, Vice Chair Morrissey. Same. Commissioner Simons. I've read the staff report and the comments that were forwarded to us from staff. Thank you, and Commissioner Hayes. Same, read the staff report, also did the Google map thing and all the comment letters. Thank you, and Commissioner Custer. Staff report, emails, and looked at Google maps. Great, thank you. Welcome, Scott, and it looks like you'll be doing the presentation this evening. 
Yeah. Good evening, uh, Chairman, members of the, of the Planning Commission, and also members of the public. I'm Scott Nightingale here to present agenda item number four for the consideration of a regular coastal permit to allow repairs to the existing revetment along portions of the 900 to 1,000 block of South Pacific Street. Uh, the applicant is Mark J. Dillon. Uh, here's an image of the project site. Uh, the subject area includes properties from <clears throat> 1027 South Pacific down all the way north to 909 South Pacific. Uh, the site is zoned R1, uh, single family, and the subject revetment for this coastal permit is within the cities of ocean size jurisdictional boundaries per the city's uh, local coastal programs jurisdictional map. A little background on the site. Back on May 12th, the applicant filed for a coastal permit, uh, CDP exemption for the proposed revetment repairs for the subject properties, as mentioned. Based on these dis on discussions with staff and also with coastal staff, the applicant then filed uh, this requested coastal permit and withdrew the exemption. Uh, due to the slumping loss of backfill support of each property on the west portion of their, of their lot, uh, portions of the revetment and stones have dislodged and uh, rolled towards the west onto the sand. Uh, this is the reason the applicant is uh, applying for this coastal permit, which was applied for and submitted back on October 20th, 2021, for the subject repairs. <clears throat> also, little little info, um, because Coastal has determined that the work is not exempt and requires a coastal permit from the city, um, Coastal and staff determined that a coastal development permit is, uh, is needed for this review, this, this coastal, uh, local coastal permit. Here's an image of some of the property's uh, existing uh, westward revetments. Uh, the proposed repairs are needed to protect against the erosion, scoring, and sloughing and slipping, and also some substance caused by high tide, storms, and wave action. You can see here as we, uh, we are getting to, um, some revetment that has, has fallen down onto the sand. Also, the ongoing uh, degradation of the revetment is a hazard to the public and others. Uh, the repairs should correct these conditions, and I'll go into the request once we finish reviewing the existing properties. As you can see, there's been uh, substantial damage by wave impact and degradation of the uh, revetment sloping, slipping down off the top of the slope and onto the beach. So this coastal permit is to allow the revetment repairs to exist. The property is located from 909 to 1027 South Pacific. Uh, the applicant is re requesting to restack the existing rock to further protect the shoreline and the existing properties from future hazards and also future hazards for the public. <clears throat> The rocks that have rolled to the shoreline would be picked up by mechanized equipment and reconfigured back onto revetment in a stable configuration. Uh, the rock would be placed such that the top of the rock dips into the slope of the revetment. Uh, also, uh, this work will all be conducted from the property's rear yards. None of the, no, no mechanized equipment will be on, to, uh, on the beach area. Also, the filter fabric behind the revetment will also be repositioned and or replaced as needed. Uh, the revetment will be backfilled with sand that would meet the 30% to 75% beach sand uh, gration percentage. And lastly, uh, the applicant's geosoils engineer estimates that approximately 5 to 10 rocks per property would be maximized uh, necessary for restacking. Uh, the applicant also indicates that if the quantity of rock uh, Actually, all the quantity of rock will not exceed the 20% increase, uh, which is specified within the seawall permit, uh, also, which is also required for, for exemptions. So they're, uh, they're staying within the, the requirements of the coastal exemption requirement. Um, this, the, the repairs here would not extend any further seaward from the existing toe of the revetment. The repairs would conform, conform to the city's typical seawall detail M19 was specified in the city uh, engineering seawall 
specifications as seen in this image below. The repairs would not occur on the public beach area and all repairs would be conducted with, with the mechanized equipment placed on each individual's rear yard and not on the sand. Further, the proposed repairs would not involve any substantial alterations such as pilings or other concrete surface or surface structures. No artificial berms or other beach materials would occur as a part of the proposed repairs. All the work would be conducted outside of the major holidays as conditioned within the project conditions and would not only be conducted at lower tides where the max high tide, but would also uh, be 20 feet from the, from the toe of their revetment. Here's an image of the city's um, elevation mean high tide uh, diagram. As one can see from the city's high tide survey map, the majority of the fallen rock is inside of the mean high tide line, which is specified in the red line here. Uh, but all of the rock that will be picked up from the rear yards will be inside of the mean high tide line. If any work is conducted outside of mean high tide line and also within the coastal jurisdictions boundaries, uh, they will need a coastal development permit through the Coastal Commission. Uh, I have placed um, two, let, two emails from the Coastal Commission specifying this, that um, if any, any work were to be co conducted outside of the city's jurisdictions, that they would need a coastal development permit. Um, I also emailed the Planning Commissioner several emails of opposition and also one in support of the project. But with that, based on the following, project meets the zoning ordinance as condition for development compatibility, uh, meets local coastal program. There will be no public coastal access impacts. Like I said, all the, all the work will be done um, at least uh, outside of the major holidays. Uh, all of the work is also required to not be conducted uh, when we have high tides. It has to be at least 20 feet from any uh, high tide area. No public coastal views will be impacted by this development, nor will there be any public parking impacts. If there is any heavy machinery that needs to be parked on the city streets uh, for any time, um, they will re be required to get a right-of-way permit. So with that, staff recommends that the Planning Commission by motion affirm the CEQA exemption and approve the regular coastal permit by adopting Planning Commission Resolution 2021 PO3 with findings and conditions. Uh, this concludes my presentation. Be happy to answer any questions. Uh, the applicant, Mark Dillon, is in the building and will make themselves known. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Before you go, I do have a question. Can you walk through one more time uh, the um, the link between the local the local coastal program and then the jurisdiction of the coastal commission? Uh, the difference between the two, if any of this overlaps, or if you know, just just kind of walk us through that one more time. I think I got it, but I want to sure. make sure I don't miss something. Yeah, Commissioner Rosales, uh, Chairman. If any work were to be conducted outside of the city's jurisdiction, um, based on the city's local coastal program maps, we, we have a, a delineation that shows any work within the mean high tide line, um, inside the mean high tide line is a city's jurisdictional area where they will need to get a coastal permit for any work. In the past, we were allowing for coastal exemptions. Uh, since that time, the direction has now changed and we are now requiring coastal permits. Um, if any work outside of the mean high tide line is conducted and also under the mean high tide line as what I've, what I've heard from the Coastal Commission is uh, now a coastal CDP, which is a coastal development permit will be required from the Coastal Commission. So if this project does get approved tonight, um, we will send out a notice of final action where, to the coastal and if they can, would like to appeal it, they can. And at that time, if they wanna require a CDP, they can ask for that. Okay, and the, and the reason I, I think I understood it, but the reason I asked is because we, I think, all received an email or a letter from, that was included from Surfrider, and they indicated that um, there was a distinction between the local coastal program and then the jurisdiction of the Coastal Commission, and were this to pass, they would step up and essentially challenge it. So, um, again, I don't need you to go over it a third time, but I just wanted to, to raise that issue. Any other questions for Scott? I did have one question. Go ahead. The, uh, the standard drawing has the grading below the mean high tide line, right? They have to go all the way down and excavate down to get to the filter paper. That seemed to be the jurisdictional issue that the Coastal Commission had 
was that if you excavate, if you excavated, not we're not talking about east west, we're talking about you know up and down. That if you had excavated below the mean high tide line, not not the east west line, but if you graded below it, then then it would fall within their jurisdiction. Could you could you address why that's not in their jurisdiction? I would probably refer that question to the applicant, geo soils engineer. Okay. Yeah, we're going to have the applicant assist on answering that one. Okay, great. Thank you. Great. Any other questions for Scott? We can always call you back up if we have others. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Applicant, if you would come forward and you have up to 20 minutes if you want to use your time. Uh, good evening. Uh, good evening. Yeah, sure. Uh, Mark Dillon. Um, I reside at uh, our own uh, property at 1011 South Pacific Street. I've been a resident of uh, Oceanside uh, at that address for 20 plus years. Um, and I am also here as a representative of uh, the homeowners in the 900 and 1000 blocks of South Pacific Street. Um, they also support uh, our repair permit request. And uh, I'll start by uh, <clears throat> first thanking uh, city manager, the planning staff, and especially Scott Nightingale for their work on our permit request. Um, uh, they have uh, been uh, invaluable in uh, helping us through this process so that we can understand it, so that we can uh, meet and exceed your conditions. and. Um, uh, we're hopeful tonight that uh, we'll get your support um, as we uh, did obtain staff support. A um, couple of other observations that I'd like to make. Uh, number one, the city's seawall ordinance uh, does allow for re the repairs we're requesting, and they're simply repairs to, exi to existing seawalls that are there today. So this is simply repair work. Uh, overdue, long overdue, and much needed repair work. Our proposed uh, repairs will not obstruct coastal access. They will not impact sh the shoreline or sand area uh, or alter any natural landforms or scenic coastal qualities because all of the repair work will occur from our backyard. The mechanized equipment will come through our own backyards and the work that will be performed will be in the backyard areas with no equipment and no construction materials placed on the beach or sand area. Um, in fact, our proposed repairs will actually allow beachgoers to, frankly, use more of the beach because the rock that has fallen onto the beach will be repositioned, restacked as part of the repair work. Right now, if you go out there, you're going to see large boulders have gone westward and are actually blocking uh, you know, the, 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 the pathway down the sand uh, from these homes to and from the pier. Uh, as I mentioned, the repairs are mu very much needed. We're experiencing erosion, scouring. Um, and the result is that our existing seawalls are unstable. They're causing rock hazards to the public. Um, also, our existing seawalls no longer protect the homes and the property. And we're particularly concerned about the risks of more rock dislodging, falling onto the beach and sand, and, and, and sand area, and becoming an obvious risk to the beach-going community to the public, to the homeowners and their guests. Um, we do need your support for us to continue to maintain the property uh, through these much needed repairs. Um, in answer to uh, Commissioner Simon's question, I hope I got your name right. Um, um, the, I, I have read the Postal Commission comments. I've read the Surf Rider comment. First, First, I, I will get to your question, but first, as to the Coastal Commission comments, 
Um, they submitted one right before the last hearing that got postponed. They submitted another right before this hearing. Uh, I've written them twice. Um, two times I've written uh, Tony Ross, Coastal Commission, asked to meet, I've asked to go over their concerns. Um, complete and utter silence, no response. Uh, I'm not sure that's the way that our state coastal commission ought to be treating its residents, but, but that's how I got treated. Um, and I'm not happy about that. Um, I, I think we were entitled to, uh, we asked for a meeting. Uh, we didn't do it in a controversial or confrontational way. Uh, we, we extended uh, an olive branch, if you will, to uh, talk with them. Uh, work through whatever issues they had. Uh, they started off by making sounds uh, about no notification. They've been notified of this for the better part of six to eight months. Um, they then made uh, comments about how if we replace the fabric, somehow we're going to be in their jurisdiction. The fabric that exists there today is there and it's on our property. It's within our PL, it's within our property line. So if we do this excavation and we remove rocks and we clear away the fabric to get to the fabric so we can redo it and make it uniform across all the properties, we're gonna be doing all of that work, east, west, north, south, all of it on our property. Not the state's property, not the city's property, within our property boundary line. So we're going to restack the rock, we're going to redo the fabric work, and then we're going to reposition the rock and probably come even eastward to make sure we don't get into the city's jurisdiction because I'm aware of the condition you're imposing. And I wanna, we want to meet the condition. We want to meet and exceed them. And we want to do so in a responsible way because major boulders are falling down and they're, they're a risk. They're a risk to the public. And, you know, I realize that folks don't want anything to happen to these existing seawalls. They want them to continue to fall into disrepair, and, and they've got a name for it, managed retreat. Well, you know, look, all we're trying to do is protect our property, protect the public, and prevent rock hazards that exist there today. And anybody that, that casually observes the situation out there ought to want these property owners to expend their, their funds and repair these rock walls. Uh, it'll benefit them, it'll benefit their property, my property, but it will also be a benefit to the city, it'll be a benefit to the public, and it'll remove existing serious rock hazard. And it will do so all within the city's jurisdiction. Uh, but we're, we have to. And, and we're going to follow the, the conditions. Uh, we did seek an exemption. Um, we were told, no, you got to go through a more formal process. We've done that here tonight. And we are, I thought staff responded pretty responsibly to Coastal Commission. And I thought they answered all of their legitimate concerns. Um, I'll say one more thing, and I don't know where my time is, but one last comment. I, too, read the Surfrider comments. Um, jurisdictional issue, I think staff has addressed. I've certainly addressed it. Uh, we're going to meet your conditions. Second, they, they, submit, they mentioned mitigation as though the repair of an existing seawall somehow is a significant impact. It's not. The, these, are, these are existing seawall facilities that are there today, and we just need to repair our home 
and our and our property. And so this talk about impacts and mitigation, it, it, it doesn't apply because our permit only allows for repair work. It does not repair work to existing seawall facility. There are no significant impacts. And because there are no significant impacts, there's no need for mitigation. It's a silly, it's, it's a silly notion. Um, and in any case, we have processed a CEQA exemption um, to address the CEQA issues. And Chair, uh, Chair you, you did mention that they might challenge the project. Uh, they might. Uh, I hope they don't. Uh, I think it's wasteful. Um, but if they do, you know, they do, and we'll deal with that. And, and it'll be unfortunate, and it'll be uh, unnecessary and wasteful, but, but we'll, we'll respond accordingly. And I hope they don't. I hope they recognize all we're trying to do is repair our seawall. With that, I appreciate your time. And, uh, and I do hope uh, you, give, uh, you give your staff support and you support this permit uh, request that we've submitted. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions before the applicant goes? I don't see any requests for questions. We'll call you back if we have any. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Yep. Again, this is a public hearing, so the uh, public is invited uh, to provide their input. Um, city planner, any slips to speak from this item? We just had two slips. Uh, one was from the applicant and one is from, I think, uh, Paul Jones is the next speaker here. Jones? Mr. Jones is a homeowner who uh, supports the application, but couldn't be here. Thank you. You don't have to have turned in a slip to speak on this item, so if anybody in the audience would like to come up and speak on this item, you're welcome to. Bring the mic close to your, so we can hear you, and then give us your name. And, and My name is Lisa Hamilton. I live at 323 South Ditmar, and I would like to speak in support of the applicant. I walk down in that area all the time. They are kind enough to have a right of way open to the public, which has been open to the public for years. As those rocks move west, big gaps open, and the public hops over. They're not gonna quit coming. Uh, these people should be able to fix this. They're gonna fix it on their own dime. Surf Rider is just about impossible to deal with. I would say please support this applicant it benefits the public far more than anything that Surf Rider could do. Thank you. Thank you. Come on up. Uh, Arlene Hammerschmidt, Ruhrlich, um, Fire Mountain. I would just like to say, where's the mean high tide line on this property? If it's, if the mean high tide line is above the rocks and the rep, rep whatever, the big boulders that are now rolled down, um, if the mean high tide line is inside this property, then this property should be let to go back to the ocean. Shouldn't have anything built on it. I believe that's state law. It's nice that the, the owners are willing to do this on their own dime. It could be that the Surfrider Foundation is, I did not read the report, I'm just reacting from what I've seen here right now. Um, you can't build, the public property starts at the mean high tide line. So if the repairs happen between the mean high tide line and the ocean, then that's not, that's not to be allowed. If it happens between the mean high tide line and the properties, the property, then it could be allowed. 
if the mean high tide line has moved now so that it is on the property, it is still not to be allowed. It should only be allowed above the current mean high tide line, wherever that is. Thank you very much for your time. And Thank I've been an ocean person. I've watched the mean high tide line change. I support Surfrider. Um, and they've won a lot of cases. They know what they're talking about. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening, Joan. Good evening, Commissioners. Joan Bachman, uh, Seaside Neighborhood. Um, yeah, I've lived here a long time as well. Um, I just want to say I'll let you decide this particular case, but in general, we need to understand that the ocean is moving forward and that managed retreat is, in fact, our future. And whether it's a $30 million home in Del Mar or mere five to eight or 10 million or whatever things are up to <laughs> here in Oceanside, um, the ocean is going to win. It just is. And uh, anybody who thinks otherwise is really going to be wasting my taxpayer dollars. So as a taxpayer, I really am not in favor of the direction the city is taking. This particular case, you guys have more information than I do, but the ocean is eventually going to win. And I do often quote, I believe, I need to look this up, but I, I believe it's in the Old Testament, the wise man builds his house upon the rock. That's over 5,000 years old. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public input before we close the item? Okay, um, the applicant still has some time on the clock. I, I think we heard a couple of items, sir. It sounds like maybe you would wish to address those items. Yeah, I'd like, I'll just take two minutes to address. Two minutes uh, would be great, thank you. To address a comment I just heard, uh, saw a picture. Um, the repair work is gonna occur from the backyard areas outside of the mean high tide water line staying within the city's jurisdiction. We have a, our surveyor here tonight, Bruce Bondi, um, and he has confirmed that the seawall uh, can be repaired from the backyard staying easterly of the mean high water line. And he's here um, as an expert in that capacity. He didn't just stop by and put up a picture on his iPhone. He's, he's been working on this for six months. Um, the city has a survey, and it showed you that survey, and it showed you the red line, and it showed you unequivocally that the rocks, the lion's share of the rocks are easterly of that red line. So they can be uh, harvested repositioned. So, um, it can be done within the city's jurisdiction, and the surveyor has done the survey work. It's consistent with the city's separate survey work. Now we have two surveyors that support this position, and we have no evidence whatsoever, not from Surfrider, not from uh, postal staff. We have no evidence of the contrary. So. What you have are two surveys, one from the city, one from our survey, surveyor, licensed surveyors, saying this work can be done and it can be done east, easterly of the mean high tide water. Um, you know, uh, we were quoting the Bible. I'll, I'll quote President Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, it's not the critic who counts. It's the folks that are in the arena who are trying to get things done. That's all we're trying to do. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we'll close the public hearing and bring it back uh, to the commission for any discussion, any questions for staff. Or a motion, whatever you're... I just have a few comments. Yeah, go ahead. Um, first off, I appreciate the uh, presentation by Mr. Dillon. And it seems like this isn't the first time that the Coastal Commission or their staff has not responded in a reasonable time frame to our staff. And that seems to be, I'm just disappointed that Coastal Commission is uh, 
so bureaucratic that they, they just can't give either a yes or a no. And in this case, it seems clear to me that the property owners just want to protect their property. And I think we all want to protect our property. And um, they should be able to do that and enjoy that. They're going to pay for it for themselves. And because of the items brought up by erosion and the rock hazards, and then to protect their property, I'm going to, I'm going to, this seems very easy for me to make a decision to support this, uh, just to support staff on this item. So with that, <laughs> I'll make a motion that we do. Uh, we recommend staff's motion that we confirm issuance of Article 19 categorical exemption for existing facilities pursuant to Section 15301 of the CEQA. And two, approve the regular COSA permit RC21-12 and adopt Planning Commission Resolution number 2022-P3. Thank you. So we have a motion by Vice Chair Morrissey. Uh, second? I'll second. Second by Commissioner Hayes. Any further discussion? I'll just make a comment a little bit about Surfrider. Um, I was around when they first uh, started. Actually, our company helped them found their Surfrider organization. And they founded it on the, on, the, on, the, on the behalf of surf breaks. It was a bunch of surfers that wanted to protect surf breaks. And their main concern was pollution and development. In this case, I'm not sure where they get involved in everybody's projects now, but this is just a repair of something that's there. It's above the mean high tide mark. I don't think, see, think these, see there's anything wrong with what um, these applicants are doing. And I appreciate the staff's due diligence on what they've done, the surveyor's work. So I would definitely support this. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second. And I would just add to the comments of Commissioner Obama. Uh, appreciate uh, staff going through diligently. Uh, we face this issue of, of projects within this area. And it's a sensitive issue. So um, I appreciate the detail that was provided. It's important that we understand it correctly. Um, any further discussion or comments? Let's vote. Chair results. Let the record show that uh, the motion passes uh, passes seven zero in favor of the project. Thank you. Okay, item five is uh, has been withdrawn per the applicant's request. So we will go to item six on the agenda which is consideration of a recommendation to the City Council okay. for a zone amendment and a local coastal plan amendment, uh, introducing uh, an amended ordinance. Um, uh. The item that we're talking about is a home occu occupancy, occupation, excuse me, amendment. And the applicant is the City of Oceanside. Uh, disclosures. Um, Staff report, uh, I think that's it for me. Uh, Commissioner Dodd, your disclosures? Um, staff reporting. Commissioner Obama? The same. Vice Chair Morrissey? Same. Uh, Commissioner Simons? Same. Commissioner Hayes? Same. And Commissioner Custer? Same. Good evening. Good evening, my name's Valeria. I'm the intern for the planning division here at the Oceanside. And I'm going to be presenting the home occupation zone text and a local coastal program amendment. Okay, so the staff recommends to adopt planning commission resolution number 2022-P08, recommending city council approval of zoning text amendment and local coastal program amendment to amend article 30, section 3007 with findings of approval. And then I wanted to offer some little background information on home occupations. So home occupations are currently uh, allowed in the following zoning districts, agricultural open space, mobile home park, um, and residential districts, inclusive of downtown districts. And there's, an, there's been an increase in home occupations with some changes in recent years. And then as of November 2021, the city has had uh, 1,926 active uh, home occupations. 
And then zoning ordinance article 30 section 3007 uh, does require an update for consistency with business license applications and policies. And we received a memo from the city council that re revealed a minor conflict with the operation of home occupations. And then the current language that's present in the home occupation ordinance does uh, prevent certain uh, visitors, customers, and clients from going to the home occupation, which can prevent uh, certain home occupation businesses from developing and uh, receiving permits. So then um, we'll be having two uh, GIS maps. This one shows uh, the home occupations that have been there since March 2020. And then the following map shows uh, the total number of active home occupations in the city of Oceanside. And so the staff proposes to amend zoning ordinance article 30 section 3007 to provide allowances for home occupations in residential districts uh, to protect the quality of life and to minimize uh, potential impacts. And so um, this slide and then following slides will present like a chart showing the staff recommendations. And so here it shows uh, three recommendations uh, to amend uh, of the floor area, area space requirement, parking garage requirement, and the storage requirement. So currently um, home occupations are allowed no more than 400 square feet of the floor area. And the staff recommends to amend no more than 20% of the gross floor area on, of all on-site structures. And then for the parking garage, currently uh, no permanent work area, workbench, or structures are allowed within the parking garage area. And then the staff recommends amending this by allowing permanent work area, workbench, and structures within the parking garage as long as it doesn't diminish the usable space for parking. And then for storages, right now we do, right now it's not, outdoor storages and indoor storages are not allowed, but the staff recommends um, permitting indoor storages as long as it doesn't diminish the usable parking space. And then leaving outdoor storages uh, prohibited. And then here it shows the employee requirement, customer requirement, and structure requirement. So we, um, so right now currently employees are not, are not um, allowed as, unless they're residents of the home. And so staff recommends uh, allowing one additional employee in the home occupation site besides the residents of the home. And then for customers, the home occupation ordinance currently does not allow any customers, clients, visitors in the home occupation. And the staff recommends allowing no more than one customer at a time between 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Um, by appointment only Monday through Saturday. And then the next one would be structure requirement. It's not specified in the home occupation ordinance. So staff proposes to uh, have it say that it shall not be altered or remodeled for home occupation purposes. And then here we show the truck requirement, uh, size and weight of the truck requirement, and then the non-conforming parking space requirement. So currently, they, the home occupation ordinance only allows one truck with a maximum capacity of one ton, and then no signage identifying the home occupation on the truck. So staff recommends no more than one truck with a maximum capacity as allowed on the residential property and to remove the signage requirement. And then for the size and weight of the truck, currently, uh, the home occupation ordinance allows a single unit truck with a maximum uh, size of 28 foot length and a weight of 24,000 pounds. And then staff recommends uh, removing this and then adding that the truck uh, be in compliance with traffic regulation um, based on street classification. And then for non-conforming parking space requirement, it's not specified on the home occupation ordinance. So staff recommends um, that existing non-conforming parking space shall be maintained. And then um, we have, I think, the last chart here, which shows the advertising requirement, non-permitted non home occupation requirement, and exceptions requirement. Currently, um, the home occupation ordinance lists that there shall be no advertising of the, uh, the address, which can attract people to the premises. Staff recommends that it be altered to say uh, there shall be no on-site advertising. And then the next one, uh, so currently the home occupation ordinance says that no motor vehicle repair shop or beauty shops or barber shops or retail shops are allowed. And then a staff recommends it to ch be changed to no motor vehicle repairs, small motor repairs or other uses that produce loud noise or no noxious fumes shall be permitted. And then for the exceptions requirement, we only, the ordinance only allows horticultural and limited use and staff recommends that it be said or a cultural limited use in sporting lessons. So um, moving on to the analysis. So the staff um, 
examined 14 other jurisdictions and compared them to our own home, home occupation ordinance. And um, these recommended updates that were listed in the previous charts um, could potentially establish social and economic opportunities for the residents of Oceanside by bettering the work-life uh, balance, reducing commute time, enhancing personal productivity and performance, introducing the potential for growth, and impacting the local economy. So basically, home occupations can promote local economic growth by increasing a job availability and, uh, and increasing the employment rates, especially among minority groups and women. So um, staff recommend the Adoption Planning Commission Resolution Number 2022, E08, by recommending City Council approval zoning text amendment and local coastal program amendment to amend Article 30, Section 3007 with findings of approval. Thank you. Thank you. Before you go, I had a question. So how are the standards, uh, either the existing ones or the new ones, how are they enforced? Scott, you want to? I could help you with that one. Yeah. <laughs> so, so now with the, uh, with the updates, um, basically we have standards in the municipal code, um, which the business license regulates. And also if occasionally we'll get a home occupation, I don't believe we get them. Uh, we, we do, I'm sorry, we do review them as well. And so we review them per the zoning ordinance and the business license, we review them per the muni code. So any regulations as specified in her presentation will be reviewed at that time. So not all of these businesses or occupations would have the requirement to have a business license, or would they all? They, they would all need a they business would all. license, okay. yeah. So that's, that's, that's the best enforcement tool right there? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, Commission um, Chair Rosales, just for clarification, so the home occupation permit itself serves as the business license for these Got it. these businesses. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for staff, Commissioner Don? Um, there's a requirement for a parking garage, and it states the, the existing is that there's no workbenches or structures, and you're asking for uh, recommending that the structures you allow a structure for workbenches. Um, as long as it doesn't diminish the usable parking space. My question is, we're, we're talking about homes, correct? Uh, most homes, there are quite a few people who don't park their cars in garages anyway. So I, I don't understand the purpose for uh, requiring that there, as long as it doesn't diminish the usable parking space. Uh, so Commissioner Dodds, uh, members of the Planning Commission, um, to clarify your point, yes, we, the city generally requires parking garages to be available for parking at all times. The current home occupation regulations don't allow any sort of improvements that work can be done in the garage. So this uh, modification would allow work to be done in the garage on a permanent workbench, um, given the fact that they don't make the the space smaller than it's allowed. So as an example, you could park in your driveway while you work during the day, and in the evening you're supposed to park in the garage. That's that's the intent of the rule. It, it's very difficult to enforce. Most folks don't, a lot of folks don't park in their garages, but we want to make sure that we don't provide any regulatory relief from that requirement to park in your garage. You always make that garage available um, for parking as it's intended. Thank you. Commissioner Obama, you had a question? Yes, mine was about uh, the amount of employees. How did you come up with the idea of one? Because like I can understand like in a smaller uh, residential home or apartment or a condo or in a, a mobile home park, I can understand the limitation to one, but what if you have a larger property and a larger house? Um, what, how did you come up with the idea of just one? We came up with the idea, as I mentioned in, in the analysis slide, we did look over 14 other jurisdictions based on their demographic characteristics and coastal characteristics to the city of Oceanside, and most of them listed one to two, and one. we found it best to stick to one. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I don't think we have any other questions at the moment. Uh, this is a public hearing, so uh, any slips, city planner, for the public? Just speak on this item. Uh, Chair Rosales, we have no speaker slips for this item. Great, thank you. Um, audience, you're welcome to come up if you didn't submit a slip. Ah, Joan, how are you? Hello, good evening, commissioners. Joan Bachman, Seaside Neighborhood. Um, if I have to come out to the hearing, I guess you'll hear from me. Um, I do like this one, and I think it is well written. I do want to bring up another issue, though, which is noise. 
and we did cover some of that, and it has uh, loud noises and things like that. Um, I do have experience with this. Um, living over on Horn Street, someone started to make uh, batting uh, pitching machines in his garage right across from my house, and I held up my phone and reported what I was hearing from inside my house and uh, sent it to our code enforcement, and they shut them down immediately. It was a grinder, zoom, 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 constant, very loud. Um, but it does bring up the issue of noise. Uh, there's a number of different kinds of noises. There's, um, you know, the obvious irritating ones, like that grinder. Um, my son almost rented a house in another city, and they had food trucks next door, and they were running all night because they had food in them, and they had refrigeration. So that's a problem. Um, also, I can hear the sprinter. It's a lovely sound, ding, ding, ding. I'm a half a mile away, and I still hear it. Uh, I can hear the lifeguard. I was much happier when I realized that was not the used car lot. It was the lifeguard. So that made the sound a lot better. Um, and in, in uh, Morro Hills, uh, it has come up about the fans and the greenhouses. So you can hear things over long ways. And those are kind of low-level, ongoing, kind of irritating noises. And they're very hard to control. So I would encourage the city to do something with our noise ordinance, because it really is insufficient. Um, if you're hearing the same person come home from work every night at 11 o'clock, goes all the way up the hill and stops which occurs in our neighborhood, um, they can't do anything about it because it's, it doesn't meet the test, but yet it wakes you up every night at 11.30 when the person comes home from work. Um, also, the mow and blow is a serious problem. Um, every house around me goes off for hours before trash day. I have entire afternoons, entire mornings that are wasted with that. So, I like this ordinance, but I would like the city to uh, pursue a noise ordinance and updates to that that really deal with some of these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bach Bachman. Um, anybody else? Come on up, sir. Hello, Bob Nelson. I'm from the Jeffries Ranch community. My concern here is the increase in traffic We've already got ADUs that people are basically running as boarding houses by converting the garages, renting out part of the rooms, the bedrooms, um, increasing tr parking. I've seen a few in our neighborhood even that have seven to eight cars parked overnight now. Now we're gonna add a business that is run tw 12 hours a day with small semis dropping off goods particular, potentially and a, an employee's car. Come street sweeper day, you're gonna have 150 cars driving around the neighborhood for the 30 minutes they're, they're doing street sweeping. Just a thought of how is all this gonna work? I'm sure that's a bit of an extreme case. There are a lot of cases that will not have many customers approaching their house, but if you've got 12 hours a day, one customer at a time, it's gonna, it could look like a drug house. Just some thought. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else before we close the public hearing? Okay, we'll bring it back to the, we'll close the public hearing and bring it back to the commission for discussion. So the rent recommended action here is to uh, move this to the city council by uh, a motion and approval if that's the commission's desire. So somebody would like to make a motion? I have a question. Um, before we vote, I, this noise issue I think is is valid and so if in fact um, a residence has a, a permit and there's a complaint about the noise would um, would there be a, an inquiry and if it was deemed too noisy could that permit be rescinded 
Uh, Vice Chair Morrissey, so typically the way these noise complaints work is they're, they're driven by some member of the community and they contact code enforcement and code, code enforcement goes out there and investigates. If they find that there's excessive noise that's in excess of the existing noise ordinance, then they would, uh, the homeowner would be issued a, a, not a citation right away, but a warning saying that this has to be remedied within a certain amount of time. So there is a mechanism currently in place to address this. Thank you. Oh, I have a question. Oh. Go ahead, Commissioner Hester. Oh, how would, at, where, where would the cutoff for the noise level be? It seems arbitrary. So, Commissioner Custer, the um, you know, noise measurement in itself is kind of a unique and kind of not a straightforward um, topic. Uh, I believe. Well, the, the, uh, you know, Scott showed me here the um, table within the municipal code that describes the, the allowable decibels um, for noise. But generally, they would go out there and noise. And it's a, it has to be sustained noise over a long period of time. And they take an average, I believe an hourly average, is how they calculate um, uh, if whether or not it's exceeding the allowable um, level for the particular zoning district in which it's located. Um, I'm not sure exactly how uh, Code Enforcement goes out there and, and does these measurements. We'd probably have to rely on them to answer that question for us more accurately. Commissioner Dodds, you had a question? Yes, there, there was the concern that was raised about delivery trucks. Um, was there any consideration about um, established delivery dates or times? Because you have many different companies with many different requirements. So there would be a lot of through traffic if there is any, any kind of if there isn't any kind of regulation. Uh, Commissioner Dodds, I'll answer that one. So as of right now, the existing regulations, as Valeria stated, allow for 28 foot long uh, maximum growth vehicles of 24 pounds. Uh, we're not changing that, um, so we're not allowing for larger anything larger than that. Um, but we are adding that any new delivery vehicle will be regulated per the traffic regulations based on its streets classification. So having larger delivery trucks over a certain ton won't be permitted, um, typically industrial type businesses and things like that. So we're actually uh, providing more regulation in terms of the vehicle deliveries. So that should be addressed in these changes. Um, I, I think that was it. Yeah, so you. Commissioner. Thoughts. I, I will add that, you know, um, as an example, I'll use Amazon as an example. They can deliver a package to your home no later than 9 o'clock, you know, up to 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night. Uh, with this, we have set business hours at their 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., so we would expect uh, deliveries to occur during that time frame and only Monday through Saturday, so it shouldn't be uh, receiving deliveries on Sunday. So that's an additional layer of regulation that currently doesn't exist. Um, so we feel comfortable with that in place that there won't be an impact to the residential character of, um, of the neighborhood in which these home occupations are located. Thank you, Commissioner Hayes. Thank you. Um, I just had one question about the addition of the sport lessons and I think it went to the comment we heard from the audience about the batting machine. And I'm just thinking, me, myself, I work from home half the time. If there were sporting lessons going on, whether it's baseball or karate or you think of something with very loud children, um, it could disturb the others that are working from home already. So what was the thought behind allowing for sport lesson, sporting lessons? Yeah, Commissioner Hayes, um, we are allowing for sport, sport lessons. Um, only and also this is the only uh, home occupation that you can do outside so any type of instruction instructional services teaching baseball or pitching would be um, if they are exceeding any noise levels that'll be based on a complaint basis um, and that's pretty much consistent on how it is now regardless for home occupations so if we do get a code enforcement complaint uh, code enforcement will go out there and they do have means to measure the the decibels of noise I've, I've worked with on projects where they were able to go out there so if they find that they meet, they exceed the average decibels for the residential district then they'll cite them and then uh, they either remove or revoke the permit if there's several violations so is the thought behind adding that is that just because other cities have been doing something similar or was there a request for these types of businesses that weren't currently being accommodated under our current business license 
So, Commissioner Hayes, to answer your question, I think it's to be accommodating to certain le certain allowances, like a music lesson, as an example. Someone teaches piano. Um, it could be a swimming lesson. Someone might have a private tennis court. It could be a tennis lesson. And currently, um, it could be a personal trainer, as an example, who, who teaches their clients in a garage. Um, so these are the ideas that, under the current framework, we don't allow those types of things. Something as innocuous as a music lesson wouldn't be allowed. So this sort of um, uh, th this sort of uh, update to the zoning ordinance would allow and accommodate these kinds of things that we do get often requests for. Um, something like a you know I'm going a little um, off board, but a little like a tax preparer might but be a home occupation. So there are a number of home occupations who could uh, see clients in their homes and, uh, and th that currently wouldn't be allowed under the current provisions. Okay. Thank you. Okay, good discussion, thank you. Um, I'll entertain a motion if that's the desire here. Jump right in there. All right, I'd like to make a mo I think this is a great step in the right direction. I think a lot of people are um, probably already doing this. I think it's great to have the city recognize it and establish an ordinance for, it, for this. So I would definitely would like to recommend to city council that we adopt planning commission resolution number 2022 PO8, recommending to City Council approval on the zoning text amendment and the local coastal program amendment, and to amend Article 30, Section 3007, with the findings of approval attached herein. Great. We have a motion uh, by Commissioner Obama. Anybody would like to second that? I'll, I'll second it. Second uh, on that motion by Commissioner Custer. Any further discussion before we vote? Okay, let's vote. Chair Rosales, let the record show that the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. That concludes our public hearing items. Um, I don't see anything on tonight's agenda for appeal of city planners determination. We do have one discussion item on the agenda tonight. Item seven is the general plan update phase two project alternatives. Um, presentation tonight by Russ Cunningham. We do not need to do disclosures on this one. So, Russ, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair Rosales. Uh, Chair, Commissioners, good evening. I'm Russ Cunningham with the City's Planning Division. And I am privileged to be managing a comprehensive update of the City's General Plan with support from my colleagues Rob D. Mahowski, Shannon Vitale, and Stephanie Cervantes. I'll refer to this project as the GPU uh, in this presentation. We are now in the second phase of this multifaceted effort, the first phase of the GPU adopted in the summer of 2019, added two new elements to the general plan, an economic development element and an energy and climate action element. These two new elements were accompanied by the city's first climate action plan, which in keeping with state law and guidance, establishes greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets, and a host of measures that together move us toward meaningful emissions reduction at the local level. All three of the components of GPU phase one advocate for smart growth, expanded mobility options, natural resource conservation, enhanced visual quality, a diverse local economy, and improved coordination with neighboring cities. These are some of the key themes of phase one that will carry over into this second phase. So it's important, I think, to emphasize that much of the policy direction for the current phase two effort comes from, comes out of the phase one documents that were supported by this body and subsequently approved by the city council in um, 2019. Um, I want to congratulate and welcome our newest planning commissioners, uh, Mr. Dodds, Mr. Simons, welcome, uh, and let you know that we are wasting no time in uh, seeking your input on a uh, very critical question facing the city. And that question is how and where should the city accommodate future housing 
and employment growth over the next roughly three decades, essentially through the year 2050. To move us toward an answer to this question, we have developed three project alternatives for GPU phase two. These alternatives reflect three separate growth scenarios that could be occasioned by new general plan goals, policies, and actions, including new development standards, new project review processes, new funding priorities, uh, strategic infrastructure improvements, and a host of new or modified city programs. Primarily for the uh, benefit of our new commissioners, uh, but also as a reminder to those have been, those um, of us, or those of you really, who have been with us uh, throughout this journey over the last uh, four years or so, I'll quickly summarize our progress on phase two to date. Uh, we've conducted initial community engagement. We took over a year to do that work. Uh, we established a very robust web page. We have an interested parties list of over 1,600 community members and other stakeholders to whom we send regular e-blasts, letting them know of progress, letting them know about opportunities for further engagement. We've held quite a number of community workshops, very well attended community workshops. We've hosted dozens of panel discussions. We've conducted several online surveys. We've held what we called office hour discussions uh, with residents within each of the city's neighborhood planning areas. Uh, we've given presentations um, to community groups and we've had dozens and dozens and dozens of ad hoc conversations um, with community members. Um, so uh, we feel good about the outreach we've done. You will find on our webpage very detailed summation of the outreach we've conducted and the feedback that we have received, summaries and recordings of uh, workshops. So if you have an interest in how we got here, uh, that's a good place to look. Um, technical studies. Um, we've conducted a range of technical studies on community facilities, on environmental resources, um, also on um, existing um, conditions, market conditions, um, and the um, current state of the local economy. Um, the latter has uh, factored significantly in to, um, well, all have factored significantly into the development of the alternatives, but um, we'll talk a little bit about um, some of the um, economic considerations uh, and demand for housing and for non-residential uh, land use going forward. The South Morrow Hills policy framework uh, was shared with this body and the city council in the spring um, of last year. Uh, we received generally favorable response from the planning commission and the city council. Uh, during discussion of the vision, the community vision that uh, came later in the year last year, um, the topic of South Morrow Hills uh, was a popular topic in, in those discussions about the vision uh, and we received um, a similar sense from this body and the city council uh, that uh, the policy direction in the policy framework is the direction um, that the decision makers want to go. You will be hearing from uh, many folks today um, as you this evening, as you know uh, from the written comments that you've uh, received, uh, there's great interest in the South Morrow Hills area and its future. Uh, and that will likely be uh, a principal uh, topic of discussion tonight. Uh, we have updated our housing element consistent with state law. This is the one element uh, that must be updated on a prescribed schedule, and we met that schedule. I mentioned the community vision and guiding principles. The, the, those came before uh, this body in the fall um, of last year. We held a South Morrow Hills Community Workshop um, about a week and a half ago. And uh, some of those who participated in that meeting are with us this evening. So welcome to those community members. Uh, we have prepared a draft smart and sustainable corridors plan. This is a plan largely funded by Caltrans under Caltrans' Sustainable Communities Grant Program that encourages, uh, as the name would suggest, smart growth, infill and redevelopment within already urbanized areas to leverage existing infrastructure, 
to promote transit, to promote walkability. And we are in the process of working on general plan goal frameworks. Uh, we're updating all of the city's general plans, um, and we are, as established uh, in our discussion on the vision, uh, we are entitling those elements in ways that signal community priorities and uh, community values. And I'm happy to talk about uh, any of those particular uh, elements, should you be interested. And then finally, we are developing policy goal and policy frameworks for each of the city's, I believe it's 17 uh, neighborhood planning areas, and, and that is in the works. So that's, that's where we stand presently. We're here tonight again to talk about alternatives. This flow chart speaks to uh, how alternatives are prepared. Um, alternatives are considered a best practice, a standard practice in long range planning. They are also a requirement under the Environmental Quality Act, the California Environmental Quality Act or CEQA. This flow chart summarizes the process of developing alternatives. We do that in partnership with the community, through community engagement, through the technical studies that I mentioned earlier and what they tell us about existing conditions and in terms of where we have opportunities and where we have constraints. Um, the flowchart speaks to utilizing these alternatives to foster discussions, like the one that we're having this evening, um, deciding on a preferred plan, and we're gonna ask this body to make a recommendation tonight to hold a vote on a preferred plan, and staff is recommending one of the alternatives as a preferred plan. And studying the potential, ultimately studying the potential environmental impacts of each of these alternatives in, in this case, an environmental impact report. So let's talk about what uh, project alternatives accomplish. Uh, they are meant to reflect different ways to achieve fundamental objectives. Our fundamental objective here is expressed in that question that uh, was presented to you a moment ago. How and where do we accommodate future anticipated growth in Oceanside? Alternatives acknowledge that there are different possible outcomes, uh, that there are trade-offs, that there are uh, pros and cons, right, to any decision uh, that we make, any approach that we choose to take. Alternatives provide opportunity for additional community input and uh, engagement, uh, and tonight is an example of that. Project alternatives, as I said, uh, must respond to sequel requirements to consider a reasonable range of alternatives to a preferred project, and that will be reflected in the environmental impact report. Uh, we believe that the alternatives that are presented to you tonight align with the community vision and guiding principles that were shared with you in the fall. And I think this is an important point. Yes, these alternatives reflect policy decisions, but they also are driven very much by conditions on the ground, conditions that exist in Oceanside today that present, again, opportunities and constraints. We are at that point in our history uh, where we have come very close to reaching build out in the traditional sense, in that there's not a lot of vacant what we call greenfield land available um, for development. So that turns our attention back to our um, already urbanized areas and how those areas can be utilized more efficiently. Where does the policy guidance come from for these alternatives? I talked about the key themes that came out of phase one, the Smart and Sustainable Corridors Plan, which will come before you uh, very soon, we will have a draft of that out for public review uh, within the next um, couple of weeks. Community input um, that has been supportive, consistently supportive of smart growth in combination with neighborhood preservation. Technical studies, uh, I mentioned a uh, market analysis uh, that looks at demand uh, for um, different types of land use, um, housing and non-residential. And you saw that reflected in uh, the alternatives report. San Diego Forward is uh, SANDAG's regional plan. Uh, the most recent iteration of San Diego Forward was adopted uh, last fall and it promulgates the so-called five big moves, which are meant to revolutionize essentially uh, mobility here in the San Diego region, how we get around. 
And this is being complemented by a comprehensive multimodal corridor plan prepared by Caltrans for the North County area that's looking to improve connections between Caltrans facilities. And we have several in Oceanside, right? We have the two state highways, 76 and 78. We have Interstate 5. How well do those connect to the city's um, local transportation network? And um, this is a, um, a very um, important question as well. To what extent are these facilities barriers, particularly to active transportation? It's not easy in many cases to get across state routes or the interstate uh, on foot or by bicycle. So we've made a point, I'm a member of the task force uh, that is overseeing this process, and we've made a point of encouraging Caltrans to look at ways to improve pedestrian and bicycle access across uh, these facilities. So they're no longer bifurcating neighborhoods uh, the way they are presently. And then finally, California law regarding climate, climate change and climate action and adaptation to climate effects, which we're already seeing. Um, state law regarding housing as reflected in the regional housing needs analysis or the RENA, which requires the city to show capacity um, for a certain number of housing units um, over the course of a what's called a housing element cycle. And we're currently in the sixth cycle that extends from 2021 to 2028. Over the course of the next uh, three decades, we'll go through two and a half uh, RENA cycles. And that's essentially how we're projecting housing growth going forward based on um, what has been historically our RENA um, obligation. So I mentioned that existing conditions are driving um, a lot of what um, you see in this report as alternatives for how we address growth going forward. Uh, we have approached build out, very little vacant land remaining, uh, developable vacant land remaining. Uh, we have very fixed boundaries in Oceanside. Uh, we have the Pacific Ocean to the west. We have a federal facility uh, to the north. We have other incorporated jurisdictions um, to the east uh, and to the south. Um, and uh, very little unincorporated area that could be annexed into the city at this point. We have coastal and wildland interfaces uh, that we want to protect and enhance and where in many cases uh, new development is not appropriate. We have sensitive habitat where new development is not appropriate. Uh, we have farmland that we want to try to preserve in the South Morrow Hills area. We have, um, as an opportunity, we have the Oceanside Transit Center and the Sprinter um, rail line uh, that extends through the Oceanside Boulevard corridor. So to some extent, these alternatives seek to leverage that um, asset, which is pretty unique to um, North County cities. Uh, we have underutilized non-residential properties that extend through these commercial corridors. And so, as I said earlier, we're looking for ways to promote more efficient use in these areas. And then I want to speak a little bit to the residential character of the city. Uh, I could show you a map if you're interested. I do have a color-coded map in my backup slides. It speaks to just how much land area is devoted to residential use in this city. And that is something that has unfolded over the city's nearly 130-year history. So we're well down the line in, in that regard. We are predominantly a residential um, community. We are working to expand employment. Um, but we need to be realistic about our ability to really significantly affect the city's jobs housing balance. That's a ratio between the number of households and the number of jobs relative to the number of households. So common, assump uh, common assumptions in the three alternatives that we'll um, discuss tonight and get input from the community on. All assume that the bulk of future housing and employment growth will be focused in our um, commercial corridors. This includes Coast Highway. I think it's a little bit of an oversight on our part in the alternatives report not to speak more to the Coast Highway corridor and the extent to which that corridor can accommodate um, additional housing and non-residential development. So um, I want to be clear uh, that Coast Highway is in the mix. It's not part of the corridor's plan, though. We've essentially addressed Coast Highway through the Coast Highway Incentive Program uh, recommended, again, recommended by this body and adopted by the City Council uh, in 2020. 
Uh, we believe that nodal areas within the corridors, those are the, essentially the major intersections, will accommodate greater intensity and density uh, of development. New housing and corridors will help to stabilize the commercial sector, which has been very transitory in many respects. Uh, we have a fair amount of vacancy in our retail and office um, spaces and have for some time. New development will be pedestrian oriented. It will activate street frontages. It will place eyes on the street. Uh, and it will, unlike a lot of the development in our corridors, um, be um, activating, um, encourage pedestrians um, to walk, cyclists to ride, people to shop. Uh, corridors will become more complete. What we mean by that is more amenable to all forms of transportation, including transit, including active transportation uh, along uh, with the private automobile. And greener, more landscape, more permeable surface area, uh, more um, opportunities for stormwater to collect and percolate and uh, be cleansed uh, and, uh, and restore our aquifers here in the city. And single-family neighborhoods, uh, as much as we want to preserve our single-family neighborhoods, they will experience some change, largely due to um, state legislation that preempts local land use authority. And that includes SB 9, which allows additional single-family units on single-family properties um, and accessory dwelling units, um, of which we've seen um, a considerable up uptick uh, in recent years uh, as those have been facilitated um, by state law. So there is an expectation that we could see as many as 3,000 SB9 units uh, over the course of the next three decades uh, and up to 1,500 additional um, ADUs over that period of time. So turning to um, alternative one, this alternative assumes uh, relatively dispersed growth within the major commercial corridors. I know that the alternatives report focuses um, heavily on Mission, Oceanside Boulevard, and Vista Way. Uh, these are the planning, er these combined constitute the planning areas uh, for the Smart and Sustainable Corridors Plan. But again, I want to mention that Coast Highway is very much in, in the mix here. Some additional housing in South Morrow Hills above allowances under current general plan and zoning designations, probably the most um, contentious um, issue before us this evening. Average uh, residential den densities of about 40 dwelling units uh, per acre, uh, again, primarily within the corridors. Uh, less retail and office relative to alternatives B and C and we'll turn to those in a, more, in a moment, and more industrial, not significantly more, but some more industrial relative to alternatives B and C. Alternatives B and C are very similar. The only substantive difference uh, between the two uh, is what each assumes about the future of Morrow Hills, and obviously that's very important, so I don't want to discount that, but that's the principal uh, difference uh, between these two alternatives. So we expect some concentration of growth within the Oceanside Boulevard corridor where we, um, I've mentioned the presence of the Sprinter. Uh, I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, under alternative B, no additional housing in South Moore Hills, so essentially status quo under current zoning, which allows for um, residential development at 2.5 acres um, per dwelling unit. Uh, under Alternative C, some additional housing in South Moore Hills um, uh, on the scale of um, 450 additional units above what would be currently allowed uh, in South Moore Hills under current land use and zoning. Average residential densities uh, approaching 52 dwelling units um, per acre to encourage, again, efficient uh, land use, particularly in areas served by transit. More retail and office relative to alternatives B and C, and I, I can speak to why, um, should you uh, be interested in the course of the discussion. And um, a little bit less industrial relative to alternatives B and C. And, and I'm prepared to speak to that uh, dynamic um, as well. So staff is recommending um, alternative C. Uh, alternative C assumes 
uh, that Oceanside Boulevard will accommodate uh, between 33 and 31 percent of future projected housing growth and about 16 percent of projected new non-residential development with the remaining percentages um, distributed within the corridors, other corridors. So again, some concentration of growth in the Oceanside corridor, some additional housing allowance in South Mara Hills, the average densities approaching 52 DUs per acre, more retail and office relative to alternatives B and C, and um, less um, industrial relative to alternatives B and C. So, you know, we believe that the, and that when I say we, the project team, um, that the centrality of the Oceanside Boulevard corridor, along with the presence of the Sprinter Line, major employment hubs, El Corazon Park, the future inland rail trail or IRT that would connect um, Escondido to Buccaneer Beach uh, with a contiguous and largely separated bike path. Um, opportunities to rehabilitate Loma Alta Creek, a significantly impaired and channelized water body. That these considerations make this corridor particularly amenable to transit-oriented development and complete streets uh, improvements. I did not mention that um, the Sprinter stations and the radii around the Sprinter stations are all designated smart growth opportunities um, under SANDAG's smart growth concept map. Uh, so that would be something that would be leveraged um, under this alternative. So we want to give you some guidance tonight on um, how to maybe think about uh, the alternatives and, and the distinctions between them to help you arrive at a, at a uh, clear uh, path for staff. Um, probably the most pressing question for most of the folks in the room and most of those who communicated with you in writing, does the commission continue to support the approach to farmland conservation outlined in the South Murray Hills policy framework? Of the three corridors, is Oceanside Boulevard best suited to accommodate TOD, which is um, transit-oriented development? Should the corridors be friendlier to active transportation and transit? That might seem obvious, but um, you know there are trade-offs uh, in making the corridor or accommodating of, for pedestrians and, and transit. Can conversion of some industrial land uh, to mixed use, and this would be particularly within the Oceanside Boulevard corridor, can that conversion be reasonably offset by higher and better use of existing industrial sites, greater flexibility under commercial zoning standards? So as we've talked about in the context of the vision, um, more flexible commercial standards that would allow 21st century industrial uses in commercial zones. When, when they're low impact and they don't adversely impact the commercial environment. And one thing I didn't mention here and should have is um, the prospect of being more restrictive in our allowances in industrial zones. We have a lot of commercial uses operating in our industrial zones because it's less expensive to do so. We have a lot of institutional uses operating in commercial zones. Are there ways to free up some of that space for, for new industrial, particularly high employment industrial. Um, how can we establish uh, effective transitions between high density commercial corridors and nearby residential uses? We made a commitment to this community that uh, through the corridors plan and through this project overall, um, we would look at how to create edge conditions that protect the single family neighborhoods as, as much as we possibly can. From, from traffic, from massing impacts, um, from um, what can bleed into neighborhoods from more dense corridors. So um, that's a commitment we've made, and um, we want to talk about how we accomplish that. So before I go to the next steps, I just I, I do want to address the, uh, the elephant in the room, and, and that's uh, the situation um, in Southmore Hills. And I want to say that, you know, while staff respects and shares 
concerns about development in the city's ag district. We continue to believe that the approach outlined in the policy framework, the South Murray Hills policy framework, is the most viable market responsive way to conserve farmland in that area. We continue to believe that widespread two and a half acre subdivision is a possibility, particularly as land values increase in that area. Um, as the North River Farms project demonstrated, the PD plan option provides another means of converting farmland to other uses. We'd like to provide a more attractive option. Um, furthermore, staff believes that catalytic agritourism uses uh, will require infrastructure that's not currently available in the area. And none of what we propose, we believe, none of what we propose in that area forecloses the opportunity to pursue other means of preserving farmland in that area. So we've talked about acquisition of conservation easements by various means, perhaps through a land trust. This is not antithetical to that. And it, we don't want to suggest that there's only one way to preserve farmland in South Moore Hills. So with that, um, I want to open up the discussion to uh, the commission and, and to our community members. Um, I will say that we do intend to get in front of the city council next week, um, if, if at all possible. Uh, that may depend on how this conversation unfolds. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll get a smart and sustainable, a draft of the smart and sustainable corridors plan out to you and the community uh, within the next couple of weeks. Uh, we will have a community open house on that plan on uh, the 19th um, of April. Uh, we will, once an alternative has been chosen as the preferred plan, uh, we will develop a land use and mobility plan around that alternative. Uh, and we will develop a um, South Murray Hills community plan based on the recommendations that come out of um, this discussion and the discussion uh, with the city council. So with that, um, I welcome uh, your questions and comments. First of all, thank you, Russ, for that great overview. Appreciate it. Um, I'll start with, I think, a simple question. Um, I read, I thought, somewhere in the staff report um, that the concentrated growth or the idea concentrated growth in the Oceanside Corridor was something like, and this is future, 33% of the opportunities in the future. I didn't, don't recall seeing anything else on any of the corridors. Can you can you speak to that, or did I did I just imagine that number somewhere? Chair Rosales, thank you um, for the question. It allows me to point out that there was, uh, on our webpage, um, there was a typo that indicated that, um, I think it was um, alternative C, uh, would accommodate 33% um, and alternative B would accommodate 33% of growth in the Oceanside Corridor. It's actually 33% um, under B and 31% under C. But that would be the largest um, percentage uh, in any of the corridors. Um, though um, it, is, it's rel it remains relatively balanced. Uh, the, the mission corridor would be expected to accommodate anywhere from 15 to 20 percent of future growth. Um, Coast Highway, somewhere in the range of 10 or 11 percent. Vista Way is pretty constrained. We have thriving shopping centers, regional serving shopping centers in, in Vista Way. But we do think there is some potential for mixed use development in, in, in that corridor, just not to the extent we see in the other, um, the other three. Does that get at your question? Yeah, no, that helps, thank you. Uh, any other questions for Russ? I have just one. Um, Russ, I, I noticed um, there was a potential to increase office and retail and reduce industrial. Do you know what the occupancy rates are of those different land use types currently? Commissioner Hayes, did you refer to retail and office? I didn't hear that first part. It was both. It, well, actually all three. Office and retail, uh, it sounds like we're increasing and we're reducing industrial properties. And I know outside of the city, um, it's been, there's been a lot of upward pressure on industrial and downward pressure on office and retail. So I was just wondering if that's being based on 
some occupancy rates that might be different here. Yeah, and, and we definitely are talking about some trade-offs here. We do think that the stretch of Oceanside Boulevard, the south portion of Oceanside Boulevard, east of El Camino Real, west of RDO, between two sprinter stations, um, is best suited for mixed-use development to leverage the proximity um, to those um, sprinter stations and to promote higher and better use in, that, in those locations. Those locations are zoned um, industrial presently. Um, we have a, a concrete batch plant. Uh, we have a, a nursery. Uh, and we have a block um, distribution uh, facility occupying um, most of that property in that area. Um, in terms of employment, and, and I think maybe fundamentally that is the issue um, between any and all land uses. How do, we, how do we promote, how do we provide more employment in Oceanside? And we think it's an open question as to whether mixed use would provide any less employment in that stretch um, than uh, we see today from, from existing uses. So that's one of the trade-offs. Also, um, I think responsive to your question is the expectation that with housing in the corridor itself, um, you should be creating additional market for retail and office. And, and that should help to, at, at minimum, stabilize um, the existing retail and office sector um, in the corridors, um, if not um, provide um, demand for additional retail and office. And I know um, that globally, right, that's changing. Um, and it's hard to know where, where we'll end up uh, with on online commerce, with telework, um, et cetera. Um, I, Valeria's presentation, I think, was very, um, uh, very um, c complimentary to this discussion in that I think we're going to see more home occupations. I think more of our employment is going to come in that form of, of home occupation <clears throat> going forward. So maybe the preoccupation with, say, industrial um, uh, is is one that um, that we don't that we can perhaps mitigate in different ways. If ultimately it's about jobs, um, I also mentioned that we're looking at rendering our commercial zoning um, standards more flexible, so that industrial use could be accommodated in commercial centers where demand is flagging. Um, and restricting the uses allowed in industrial areas um, to industrial uses. And then finally, we, we've done a lot of assessment and, and concluded that there is a fair amount of underutilized industrial land uh, and that we can f explore ways to promote higher and better use of existing um, industrial areas. Go ahead. One other thing I was curious about. I know one of the problems with the Sprinter right now not attracting enough passengers is its headways. So is there any discussion about the headways being reduced so there's more ridership? Yes. So um, I mentioned um, Sandag's uh, regional plan, um, San Diego Forward. Uh, the expectation is that most of the Sprinter corridor uh, will be double-tracked uh, and that headways um, will improve in some cases to um, 15 minutes uh, during peak periods, which is typically that magic number, right, where you don't think about the schedule. You just show up and you know that there's going to be a train within a reasonable um, period of time. So uh, we're hopeful that that happens. I think that would have alleviated some of our concerns over some of the affordable housing projects that have been taking the Sprinter as a credit for being able to say that they're by transit, because if it's 30 minutes, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, Commissioner Baum, I know you have a question. I had one more for, for Russ. Back to the jobs and uh, housing ratio. Is there a sense that alternative C gets us closer to the ideal for that ratio as opposed to uh, A and B? No. OK. No. Um, what I will say is that there's not a lot of difference between the three alternatives with respect to where we might end up with a jobs housing balance. Um, alternative A assumes we could, we could get to, and this is close to where we are, 0.73 jobs per household. Um, B and C assume just under 
0.7. So as I said earlier, the residential character of this city built up over the better part of 130 years has in some ways um, created the situation that we're in that is in some ways, you know, intractable. So I think the focus on jobs housing um, is one that could lead to a fair amount of frustration uh, in, in the years ahead, which isn't to say by any means we don't look for ways to expand um, employment opportunities. Uh, yeah. So, the, so the, the desired metric of one to one might not be achievable, but we we make every effort to try to get to that number. Is that kind of what you're saying? I think we do make every effort to to get to that number uh, with with a realistic expectation uh, about the possibility of doing so. Yeah. Right. Commissioner Obama. My question is kind of about what's it going to look like as far as what your vision is for uh, like Oceanside Boulevard, adding more retail office, mixed use, the heights at the nodes. I mean, do you, you probably have, a, I know with the Oceanside corridor or the vision plan we had with that, we had a lot of uh, undulating things about how high it went in certain areas and went down low so you could kind of have different interests. Like, are you thinking the same things for Oceanside Boulevard, Vista and Mission, the same kind of idea? And how does residential address the streets? as I know that um, a few people are very passionate about. How, what's your vision for that, or what are you thinking for how that works? <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Ball. And I will begin by saying that, that we are taking a page or two out of the Coast Highway Incentive District, okay. um, looking at probably um, a form-based code that um, promulgates what we call objective um, design um, standards uh, that um, really allow for some um, consistency and predictability about what sort of product you're going to get um, at the end of the day. Um, those standards um, include uh, allowable building types, allowable frontage types. Um, they speak to articulation, both horizontal and vertical articulation of buildings. They speak to um, street presence through a certain amount of transparency at the ground level, like storefront glass, um, that uh, allows uh, that, that, uh, that transparency, permeability, so to speak, so um, passers-by can, can look in and see activity, mm -hmm. and those inside can, can look out and be part of, the, part of the streetscape, even though they may be indoors. Um, so these are um, some of the considerations that are addressed in the incentive district uh, that we think will probably carry over um, to the um, specific plan for the corridors. So it sounds like you're kind of going towards architectural standards and ideas of what things are going to look like, which may help us a little bit with the density bonus projects that come along and we don't really have any way to kind of really dictate to them how it's going to look and feel. So do you think that by establishing the, these kinds of corridors and then when a density bonus project comes along, we can actually push a little bit on them to maybe make them fit? our city standards a little bit better? Or? We would like to think so, but as our, our city planner and others will tell you, um, density bonus uh, is a pretty thorough preemption of, of local discretion over projects that, that qualify uh, for density bonus based on the percentage of affordable uh, units provided. So um, as you've learned, um, having um, reviewed uh, these projects um, over time, um, state law allows for concessions and waivers that essentially allow um, the applicant to make the argument that we cannot provide the city with what it wants, which is the affordable units, um, unless we can have some flexibility uh, with design standards or with development standards, setbacks, parking, building height, Etc. So that's a that's a tough one. Uh, we are working with our city attorney um, currently to understand what the implications of density bonus may be for the Coast Highway corridor um, uh, regime, essentially, and what it may mean uh, for the corridor's plan. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, we'd like to get public input. That's what this discussion is about. So um, we can always come back to the commission for additional commentary. Um, city planner, you want to start calling folks up? 
Sure, Chairman Rosales. We have 13 uh, speaker slips uh, submitted for this item. Um, we'd like to remind the public that there's two podiums on which you can queue and speak. So Scott's going to start calling out names, and please come up in the order in which you're called. Thank you. All right. First public speaker is Diane Nygaard. Please come up to the podium, followed by John Botloff and Ellen Barlett. Diane? You'll each have three minutes, and reminder, give us your name before you start speaking. Oh, gosh, I thought some people said there was something stapled to their seats that said they had five tonight. Nope. I don't think so, We unless we've changed our, our standards. Uh, <laughs> city planner, there's there's been a suggestion that we're offering five minutes for each speaker. There's no, there's been no discussion on five minutes. It's three minutes per speaker. Thank you. Chair. Um, well. We're going to limit you to three minutes. Okay. Let's see. Um, good evening. Uh, new commissioners, chair, old commissioners. Um, tonight's staff are asking for recommendation on their preferred alternative C. They specifically ask you to take a vote. Um, I note that the agenda says this is a discussion item. To me, a discussion and a vote are two very different things. So consider what kind of public notice has been given for that action tonight. Um, this is going to affect our community for generations to come. This is probably one of the most important decisions you're going to make sitting in this chamber. Um, you need all the facts to make the very best possible decision that you can. But who can really say what we're getting with alternative C or in fact with any of these alternatives? Clearly with C we're getting hundreds of housing units on our farmland. The workshop on March 16th was mentioned. Um, this has been characterized as building on our farmland as something that's popular. To me the popular, you know, like the kid in high school was the one everybody liked. This is not a popular plan. This is the single most controversial issue in this plan. And that's why it requires very careful consideration and doesn't make sense to even do that now. It's very unfortunate we had a workshop less than two weeks ago. Where's that information? Should that not have been part of your consideration tonight? Um, we think it's premature to make that decision. In fact, it's very clear that there are many reasons not to put that, uh, farm, that housing on our farmland, and we ask you to, to just say no to that. How well do any of these alternatives protect our remaining sensitive natural land? This uh, alternatives analysis has a category called open space, parks, and preserves. Those are three very different kinds of land. What matters is sensitive habitat. There's not one figure in that alternatives analysis. There's not one policy description that ensures any of us that we've actually protected the right natural lands. There's going to be a detailed um, inventory of that. Of that. It, you won't see that for months yet. You're being asked to make a decision tonight without knowing that. Um, I'm not going to talk about the housing distribution. But it was very wonderful to come here tonight and finally get an answer to the job housing ratio. What is the differences between those three alternatives? It wasn't in the alternatives analysis report. It wasn't in the staff report. Uh, it's nice to hear it here tonight. But was that not a disturbing answer to all of you? I'm, I'm sick. I'm sick. The economic development element of this commission, this was adopted in 2019. It says for economic sustainability in this city, we protect seven economic drivers for this community, including 75 acres of industrial land to be added. And we're not, we're recommending not doing any better than we are today. And that's probably all I can say tonight. This is the most important decision you're going to make. It's going to last for generations. Take the time to do it right. Thank you. Thank you. Next, next speaker is John Budoff, followed by Ellen Bartlett and Barbara Collins. John? Hello, so I'm John Budoff. So I had a couple of things I want to talk about. Um, I've lived in Southern California for over 20 years. And when I first came here, I flew into LAX, rented a car, and drove down to San Diego. And what struck me, I came from Kansas City, a lot of wide open space. 
What struck me driving down is that it, until I hit Camp Pendleton, it felt like one city. There was no open spaces. There was no break. It was just houses, businesses, houses, businesses, until I hit Pendleton. I ended up in Oceanside because I love the fact there was open spaces. It did, you didn't feel like you were living in this dense urban environment. And that's something that, you know, as Russ and his team and you guys have to decide is what is the character of Oceanside, the city of Oceanside? What do you want it to be? And make sure that the development that comes on that you guys have to approve and Russ's team, you know, plans maintains the character of Oceanside. Developers want to develop every square inch. That's what they want to do. Developers want 75,000 story buildings every square inch because that's how they make money. But that destroys the character. You guys have to decide what do you want Oceanside to be in 10 years, 20 years. Do you want it to be urban? Do you want it to be New York City? Or do you want it to be this rural farm community? Is that what you want? Because there is a limit of how many people can live in an area. That's just the reality of it. So you guys have to balance of what the character of Oceanside is versus how many people can you possibly live here? You know, we, we, we have to be efficient, that's, that's for sure, right, with commercial, uh, commercialization and residences, but at some point, you cannot continue to stuff people into a finite area. Uh, as Russ said, right, we've got the ocean to one side, Camp Pendleton the other side, we can only expand so many places. So it's up to you guys to say, what is the character of Oceanside how do we protect that while still providing economic opportunities for people? And, and this is a farming community. So please keep in mind that open spaces need to be protected. They need to be preserved. Uh, we all like the open spaces. Farms, though, have a massive amount of pesticide use. Uh, I sent you all an email with a comment, a lot of links in it about the massive health risks of living near pesticides. So. Please work with the city, work with the county and the ag commissions to get farmers to stop using pesticides so we can maintain our public spaces, we can maintain our quality of life, and uh, everyone can have a better life. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ellen Barlett, followed by Barbara Collins and Dolores Welty. Ellen? Uh, good evening. Can you hear me okay? I don't want to. I'm <laughs> sorry. Um, after reviewing the general plan update for the project alternatives, I believe it contains far too many inconsistencies and ambiguities to be useful for making any recommendations at this point. I think you need to step back and we've only uh, gotten the report on that we could look at it on uh, March 23rd and that's really not enough time for, for the community to have a chance to look it over. And whichever plan the city adopts, it's gonna impact us for many years to come through at least 2050. And so we need a clear and accurate and complete information before uh, we all make a decision. And you're the ones that are gonna uh, be commenting to the city council. The report states on page three that cluster housing will be used as a key strategy to maintain the agricultural heritage of South Morrow Hills. To me, that's an oxymoron. How does one maintain agricultural heritage by building cluster houses on farmland? Um, if the city really desires to uh, save farmland, there are strategies. I know Russ talked about a few. In addition to cluster housing, I think these should be the only things that we should be looking at and not cluster housing on South Morrow Hills. For example, um, the TDR program should not be um, received on agricultural land. It should be in the uh, smart and sustainable growth areas. We should be uh, looking at the uh, developing an agricultural easement program similar to the San Diego County's PACE program, require developers to uh, mitigate for their destruction of uh, sensitive habitat by requiring them to preserve other habitat within our city, and also possibly establishing a land trust permanently to protect agricultural land for agricultural use such as Marin County does very successfully. Protecting our natural resources must be a priority um, encroaching on along borders of sensitive habitats, such as the riparian habitats and wildlife corridors will ultimately lead to their demise. The COVID pandemic has given all of us a glimpse into what occurs when global supply chains are disrupted and broken down. We can all see that. We must eat to survive, and we currently have the means to grow food locally we must cherish our local resources. None of us knows what the future will bring. 
We cannot put 25% housing and 5% tier two um, agritourism out there and expect that we will still be able to farm in the future. Um, agricultural land is a natural resource and should be treated as such. We learned that back in grade school. We should not be selling off our precious resources for housing developments which can be constructed in far more suitable areas of the city. We do not need to develop South Morrow Hills to have enough housing in Oceanside. And I just want to say I do not support any alternative that builds cluster housing on Oceanside Farm. Thank you. Our next speaker is Barbara Collins, followed by Dolores Welty and Joe Hill. Barbara. Good evening, commissioners. I'm Barbara Collins. I'm a 24-year resident of East Oceanside, and I'm here tonight on behalf of the Sierra Club. Um, we, the Sierra Club, is support. Uh, we support preserving the farmland in South Morro Hills, and we uh, do not support a drastic increase in the housing density in the to be included in the general plan. We understand and we appreciate the considerable staff time and resources that have been expended to provide this alternatives report and also the stated goal of preserving the farmland. Nevertheless, we are strongly opposed to any plans or recommendations for dense housing development in South Morro Hills. The vast majority of Oceanside residents have demonstrated opposition to that also. First, the facts, the technical studies, and the analysis within the alternatives report and the other related reports from the city do not explain or support how the, how the South Morrill Hills farmland will be preserved by increasing housing density by a minimum of 250% and even denser clustered housing development in South Morrill Hills with the TDR plan. The TDR proposal is a key concern of the Sierra Club. We haven't been able to find a single example of TDR preserving farmland in the way that it's been proposed to be done here in this city. Many Oceanside residents have expressed concerns about this very same thing Staff reports also have not cited a single example of TDR working the way that it is being proposed. Um, the, um, another critical problem is that the, um, the uh, draft housing element and the, and the uh, climate action plan that was adopted three years ago, the alternatives uh, A and are in, are in direct conflict with that. Uh, this is a very serious flaw, um, and it should be addressed now while the general plan update is being developed. Sierra Club supports the smart and sustainable corridors as outlined in the draft housing element. Draft in those areas will meet the um, regional housing needs allocation. You do not need the dense development in South Morro Hills to meet that. Uh, so the plan to develop South Morro Hills is completely inconsistent with that. We urge you to recommend that the city focus on fostering growth in smart and sustainable corridors and um, preserve the farmland, grow agribusiness and agritourism. Thank you very much for the opportunity to comment. Thank you. Next speaker is Dolores Welty, followed by Joe Hill and Lisa Hamilton. Dolores? Yes, I'm Dolores Welty. And through my life, I've lived in a lot of different places in Oceanside. Uh, at this point, I still have two properties here on McClure and Heatherwood. <laughs> Years ago, my son went to kindergarten at Dittmar. And after school, we would go down to swim in the ocean from 3 o'clock till sunset. It was glorious, absolutely glorious. And there are other parts of Oceanside that are just as glorious and just as precious. I'm sure you know, as I do, that San Diego is one of the most diverse flora and fauna places in this whole United States. 
In the county of San, Di San Diego, there are 1,800 endangered species. In Colorado, there are 11. Baja is the same. It's very uh, diverse. And so I come here to ask you to protect that diversity in every chance you get. We found an, one of my friends rather found an Encinitas baccarat by the railroad track. Oh, we put a protection around that. It's very precious. We've discovered we need nature. We also need farmland. The transportation problems that we are having at this time don't affect us very much as far as food is concerned because California is an agricultural state. But that is not true in the rest of the world. And once you begin to build all over your agriculture, it will not be true here. It will not be true here. So I, I come to ask you to protect your agriculture as much as you can. I don't believe two and a half acre uh, homes are protection. Uh, I ask you to choose B. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker is Joe Hill, followed by Lisa Hamilton and Roger Davenport. Joe. Good evening, Planning Commissioners. My name is Joe Hill, 22-year resident of Oceanside. It appears just by the theme tonight that possibly that there's a rush to judgment on where we should put this plan based on all of the information that I know that questions have been submitted to staff. We haven't got at to, to a lot of those questions, and I have some more. And I think you all need to see the answers and see the question to help you understand better that, you know, where, where this is all going. Um, I think this plan should, is so important that it needs to be left out of the GPU and these three alternatives until every agritourism venue idea is explored and determined workable or not. One specific housing workshop has been held with public participation without public questions, but an additional agritourism venue workshop has not been held, and we have no financial analysis from Kaiser Marston about agritourism venues and, and how, they would, how they would work. This plan needs further work and study, and then we should add it back into the GPE group alternative at a later date. There are just too many loose ends and questions. We are all aware that this plan was created for additional revenue streams for the farmers. But supposedly, these farmers, landowners, are really serious about compromise in the type of revenue stream that is built. I was told that by a farmer. And the Chamber Tourism Group is anxious and excited to participate. So let's continue to work on this and come up with a realistic and acceptable plan. Uh, here are my questions. Why is the number 75% used for conserving farmland? Why wasn't it 90? Who, who, who made that decision? Did we throw darts, spin a wheel, or draw cards, or vote? I don't know. We haven't been told. What about all of the issues that still come up about the sewers? And the, and the plans for putting sewers out there, and, and it, we keep hearing things. Will CFDs to pay for this project even pass a property owner vote? There are 190 actual property owners in the valley there. If we continue to maintain the agricultural zoning there, can we prevent ADUs in the valley for SB9? That's for Russ. And TDR programs have been around for 50 years. The majority of research on file shows they have not worked. Is there a secret location here in California where the TDR has worked for the land use project that we're proposing? Can anyone tell us where it's at? Those are the loose ends. We need to get the loose ends tied up. Here's the bottom line. I believe everyone on Oceanside knows the changes are going to come to South Morrow Hills to help the farmers. I, I, I don't think anyone expected forced density housing to be that plant. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Next speaker. Next speaker is Lisa Hamilton, followed by Roger Davenport and Cindy Davenport. Lisa. Good evening, Commissioners. I'm wearing a t-shirt, the SOAR t-shirt, from the effort to preserve open space 
start up the business the five, six, seven, eight. I just dropped maybe paper parts that I had on the SOAR project a few days ago. I didn't know I would still have the T-shirt that I would need it. We're still here. Um, this is a discussion of various alternatives, but the choices are stark. And somehow the staff feels that the best alternative is the one with the most housing units. How does this save agricultural land? Once it's built, it's gone forever. We have scarce details on other items. Only alternative B will actually protect agricultural land. I don't so much begrudge the profits that the farmers will make from this. I'm an Oceanside homeowner myself, and if I sell my house, I'm going to make a tidy sum. So I don't begrudge the farmers that. But these plans cost, call for thousands of houses, a net cost to the city. Housing is always a net cost to the city when you have to build out the kind of infrastructure that has to build, be built out to develop housing in South Morrow Hills. This is going to come for, for the benefit of a few people making a lot of money out of this, and they certainly will, no question about it, at the expense of the community and the whole community, the whole city has to pay for that infrastructure. Beyond this, we know that there are unbuilt lots with the de density bonus that are about to seriously uh, damage neighborhoods by their overbuilding because of the density bonus. We have no guarantee that the same thing isn't going to happen in South Morrow Hill. So I ask you not to consider A and C but to consider only B, because only B preserves agricultural land and open space. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Roger Davenport, followed by Cindy Davenport and Linda Slater. Roger. Hi, Roger Davenport, 541 Crouch Street. Been here 10 or 12 years, whatever. Uh, like a bad penny, high-density development in South Morrow Hills keeps coming back. It's clear that the South Morrow Hills plan has been basically hijacked, and the only ones who really benefit, as he was just saying, are the large landowners and developers. The city loses, and the city's residents also. There are a lot of good sounding words in the uh, alternatives report here, but it's a glaring inconsistency that they include the South Morrow Hills community plan as, as currently proposed. It's totally inconsistent with all aspects of our Oceanside vision and planning documents. For example, as Russ pointed out, in the phase one updates, the climate action plan and so forth, they call for promoting agriculture and agritourism to increase jobs, call for smart growth instead of sprawl, reduced greenhouse gas emissions, reduced vehicle miles traveled, Dense clustered housing in South Morrow Hills is not consistent with any of these. It's a poster child for sprawl development, as we've said from the beginning. And to be clear, sprawl is bad, okay? All right, uh, also, you know, Russ talked about infill and redevelopment among, along our east-west corridors as a source of housing not greenfield housing development in South Morrow Hills. All that does is maximize profit for developers and allow people who've owned land here for decades to monetize it better. It doesn't help the city, and we don't need the housing that would be put into South Morrow Hills. Everything shows that we have plenty of room elsewhere to do that. Um, also, page four talks about preserving ecological, scenic, and recreational values, riparian areas, hillsides, and stuff. Putting so dense housing in South Morrow Hills doesn't do that. So I'm saying that the South Morrow Hills proposal as it is now is inconsistent with our planning documents. If we continue to pursue this proposal and this approach with high-density clustered housing and transfer development rights, et cetera, might as well just take out the smart growth language and admit we aren't going to do any of the nice things we talked about in the vision plan and our other policy documents. It's ridiculous. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Cindy Davenport. 
Shepard, followed by Linda Slater and Hi. Nancy Sublet. <laughs> Good Cindy. evening. I'm Cindy Davenport, a resident since 2008. Been traveling lately, so I'm going to keep my mask on and protect everyone. Hope you can hear me okay. Um, I, we can tell there's been a lot of work done on uh, this uh, phase two plan. We appreciate staff's hard work and we know um, they're pretty smart. And so we appreciate your time in evaluating everything as well. But as, as has been pointed out, there's a lot missing. I attended the workshop um, on the 16th and so um, I don't think you have been made aware of what happened there. A lot of people um, uh, spoke for each group and the majority of people were saying, we want to preserve farmland and we want to promote agritourism. So um, cluster housing does not preserve farmland. Now, if you come out and say, well, we only want to preserve 75% of the farmland, well, <laughs> that's what cluster housing does. So either be up front or, and say we're only preserving 75% or let's say let's really preserve farmland. And by the way, in our climate action plan in chapter four, page 18, it shows that by this year, the city of Oceanside was supposed to have put 100 acres of farmland into agricultural conservation easements. So that hasn't been done yet, but was there a calculation made? Um, by 2030, we're supposed to have 500 acres uh, conserved. So does that get just um, subtracted from the 75% that we're supposed to preserve? You know, there's a lot of details missing. <laughs> so um, also people uh, brought up questions at the workshop about the right to farm. If you put housing next to farmland, People are gonna complain. It, uh, farming and houses, they just don't mix. So one of the questions was, well, how do you make this right to farm ordinance uh, you know, watertight? How do you really protect the farmers against people complaining about their work? So that's a question that needs to be answered and looked at. Um, but you know, why, <laughs> why go to all that trouble? Just preserve the farmland, period. Keep it at one housing using unit for two and a half acres as it's been for decades, and that will preserve the farmland that we have left in Oceanside. So please do make sure that uh, this document uh, conforms to the Climate Action Plan and to the housing element. We want smart growth in the smart growth corridors. I live near Oceanside Boulevard. I'm excited to see uh, development happen there. That will help uh, our residents. Thank you. Thank you. Linda Slater, followed by Nancy Sublet and Catherine Carbone. Linda. Hi, my name's Linda Slater. I'm a 16 year resident of Oceanside. And I wanted to speak tonight because uh, I'm very concerned and I'm complaining about part of the process, namely the part that about a public input. And I attended many, I think most of the public input sessions, and I received the Onward Oceanside email. I kept informed. So I probably know more about the situation than the average citizen here in Oceanside. But it became so frustrating it, it, it looked like this idea of getting public input, that was, they were totally disingenuous. It wasn't, they didn't want our input. They wanted to say, oh, we had all this public input. But I don't feel that they listened to us. There were issues, important safety issues that came up every meeting, namely traffic. And what if we have a fire? Like, we had lilac hills. How are we going to get out of there? Because it's going to be all bottlenecked. And to my knowledge, that has not been addressed. And I just, it's, it seems like the whole public input process was an exercise in futility. And so I think this needs to be reevaluated 
And the public says, we do not want housing built on South Morrow Hills. And I don't care what the different justifications are. That you need to listen to the public. That's the whole reason for the process. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Nancy Sublet, followed by Kathy Carbone and Larry Balma. Nancy. Hi, my name is Nancy Sublet, and I live in the Jeffries Ranch area, so I'm out close that way. And when the um, when this development first came up, I th I thought, how how could they think about building a development out there when their 76 is the only road, and they don't have sewers, water, and fire, and all that, and um, but tonight, I learned a lot. I appreciate all the work that's been done. And what I learned is that the term, I think, was build out. So if you look at the map of Oceanside, where do you see a big, uh, dense, uh, blank slate? Uh, and it's, it's where the agriculture is. And, and it is the blank slate because it is agriculture. And so um, that build out would be expensive and at the sacrifice of the... Uh, of the topography out there. It's lovely to, to drive down 76 and, and see all those hills. And the traffic is bad now. I can't imagine what it will be like. Uh, I time when I go to, the, I'm retired, so I kind of choose when I leave for the most part. And uh, I time when I go to the grocery store, which is, which is just up the hill. So um, you've had a lot of good input and I'm not as knowledgeable as most of the people here, but I wanted to sh speak because I live in that area and expect that my travels and daily existence will be significantly impacted uh, to the detriment. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Catherine Carbone, followed by Larry Balma and Rob Howard. Catherine? Good evening, Planning Commission. My name is Catherine Carbone. I'm a Fallbrook resident. I was a proponent of No on Measure L in 2019 and 2020. You might remember Measure L. Uh, it's where 67% of Oceanside voted to keep the additional housing out of South Morrow Hills. I urge you to consider not only those voters, but also the communities to the east as you determine any updates to the city general plan. The communities of Bonzel and Fallbrook have no idea this is happening tonight, but yet they'll be impacted by your decision to recommend higher density in South Morrow Hills. For me and many residents in Fallbrook, wildfire evacuation is the main issue, not preserving farmland. You as the Oceanside Planning Commission hold the legitimate power to recommend action to city council, who will then likely act upon your recommendations. With that legitimate power comes responsibility. I would submit to you that you hold the mantle of responsibility for those who cannot fight individually for their own best interests. In fact, that's why we had a ballot measure, so that the people could speak, and they spoke. So now I would ask you to honor the voice of those people and recommend to council that they do not increase the density in South Morrow Hills. I was very glad to hear Mr. Cunningham remark that there would be increased communications with neighboring communities. The people of Fallbrook and Bonzel that you've collaterally, that you're collaterally making decisions for, would appreciate it if you would consider their best interests also. That's my community. Those are my neighbors. Those people are my friends. Please do the right thing and recommend no housing density changes in South Moro Hills. Building housing clusters on farmland does not conserve farmland. Building housing clusters in that wildland urban interface could cost lives. Please vote to recommend option B in front of you tonight. Thank you. Thanks. Next speaker is Larry Balma, followed by Robert, <coughs> Rob Howard and Bob Nelson. Larry. I'm Larry Bama, president of the South Morrow Hills Association. Uh, I live on Sleeping Indian Road and uh, and farm. 
I uh, just, it's a tough one. Not everybody understands what's going on out here. The South Morrow Hills Community Plan maintains agricultural zoning and conserves farmland on 20 acre and larger parcels while retaining two and a half acre estate home designation on parcels smaller than 20 acres. South Morrow Hills existing two and a half acre minimum zoning plan invites planned developments on any large piece of land over 10 acres. Changing zoning from ag to residential with no provision to conserve any farmland at all. We saw this with the North River Farms project. It hasn't gone away yet. It's the first developer that ever came out there and they broke the system. If we don't have a new plan, it's gonna be all houses out there. We've been working for 12 years with our committees, with the city, trying to figure out what can we do. And since 20, we've had meetings with our neighborhood all the time. We've got 180 homeowners out there, or not homeowners, but landowners. We've got about 150 homes out there. It's a two and a half acre minimum. If you want to save farmland, you can go out there and buy two and a half acres and farm it yourself and save farmland. But the developers aren't going to come for the two and a half acres. They're going to come for the bigger pieces. And we've got to have some sort of a plan. Most of the South Morrow Hills stakeholders understand that we need a plan. All of our state homeowners and large landowners see the benefit of conserving our land for agriculture and agritourism. Most agree that a cluster of homes could allow conservation to be a viable option. The key element to this new plan is a draft of the deed restriction that will conserve the land for agriculture or agritourism. If, if the conservation plan doesn't work, we don't have a chance out there. Because, you know, TDRs, nobody I've talked to out there, large or small landowner, nobody, wants to sell TDRs and, and nobody wants to buy TDRs. It's, there's a lot of things in the plan that, that are just not an issue. As we get this plan a little more resolved, you're gonna see what's going on. And I just wish that all you people could have come to all the public meetings that we had discussing this for 12 years in, instead of waiting now and saying, no, we don't want any plan at all. South Morrow Hills is committed to work with the city to try and figure out the solution. Thank you, Mr. Bala. Next speaker is Rob Howard, followed by Bob Nelson and Joan Bachman. Uh, hi, commissioners, staff. I really do appreciate you all taking the time to hear um, public comment. One, I just want to start with, on one of your slides, I got a bit confused now. I'm from Tennessee, so I'm a little slow. But you had preferred plan alternate C, and then a couple of the bullets said it was more retail and office relative to alternatives B and C. But if that's the one you preferred, but it has more, then I got confused about that. So there were a couple of bullets for that. The other thing, that, a couple of things I wanted to say is I'm, I didn't get enough time to get through all of the plans, which was an issue for me, because I do like to actually get through them. So far, of the ones, B is the one I support for a couple of reasons. Number one, I feel like the overall piece of it isn't taken from the perspective of an overall plan, housing, transportation, and energy. And the reason I say energy and utilities, if we build out there, then, uh, oh, first, Rob Howard, uh, I live on Composition Court, 
in Oceanside. I'm a 31, two-year resident of Oceanside. Um, if we build out there, there's going to be utilities that are going to be required for everyone else to pay for. Um, the other thing is, I just, I'm confused as to why it was okay to go hire more dense downtown with hotels, but not hire more dense along those corridors where now we can go to Sandag and, and plenty of people in Oceanside will say, instead of building out there on the farmland, we want you to invest in mass transit along Oceanside Boulevard, along 76, down the corridor, so we get people in the cars. Because most of it, what's kind of interesting about it is we focus on that part of it. But what I'm concerned about is the people who we have working downtown, they're going to be, they're not making that much money. So they're going to have cars that are older. They don't get the Tesla. So we need mass transit to get them into work as well because they can't afford the housing in that area. So let's go up along the corridors. We can make them look good and be beautiful in that way. Um, the other thing is, um, talked about the infrastructure. And when we start talking about housing, I want workers to be able to afford the housing because we build a lot of big housing and it's expensive. And then the short term rental folks come get it. And then our housing issue didn't get any better. So that's another area to look at. And, and with regard to energy, we're doing our construction yet. I don't hear anything about microgrids. I hear solar, I hear sustainability, but I'm talking about reliability, having something that is reliable. And if you do your do microgrid build out in the things that we're doing, we can individually meter multi-unit housing and you can save money, which we're going to need if we're forcing housing in other places that we're going to have to build the infrastructure for. And, and honestly, I could go on and on when it comes to having an overall vision, put all the pieces, don't just take one or the other these all things have to work together because, I mean, I can imagine being a farmer out there with the cost of water. It's got to be crazy, but we should be trying to help them all together. If Oceanside is going to be the community we say it's going to be, then let's be that. So thank you all for your time. I appreciate it. I apologize for going over. Thank you. Next speaker is Bob Nelson, followed by Joan Bachman and Daniel Dominguez. Bob? Hello again, commissioners. Um, I've provided a little letter, kind of a summary of some of my comments. Essentially, what I see is the transition uh, or the transfer of development rights is probably the primary issue. I remember seeing congratulatory uh, phone messages all from 949 area codes right after we had some of the earlier uh, meetings on uh, planning in South Morrill Hills. I would suggest rather than the clustered housing, we add some infill two and a half acre properties to the areas where we already have two and a half acre properties, maybe in a couple other areas, to a limited amount and concentrate on the agritourism and the percentage of land available for agriculture versus development with hotels, et cetera. I give you the examples of Ventura and Temecula who are tourist oriented. Uh, the, the, everybody's probably familiar with the wine country in Temecula. They have helped the tourism along with Ventura, saving a lot of agriculture there. Look at those programs. I'm, I would think planning has probably done some of that, but I think we need to eliminate that transfer of development rights and not allow the two and a half acres on everything, but a small percentage, not the 400 high clustered housing. As other speakers have said, it's difficult to keep the agriculture when you start building a lot of homes. I remember working in Orange County uh, when the areas around El Toro Marine Corps base had enough housing that they were able to convince their congressional members to get rid of the uh, military base. And now the city of Irvine's used about two thirds of that for housing. Thank you, and uh, I know it's a tough decision. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. Next speaker is Joan Bachman, followed by Daniel Dominguez and Aaron Moore. Joan? 
Hello, Commissioners. Joan Bachman again. Um, quickly on the industrial, we have plenty of industrial. We filled it with a Coke warehouse and an Amazon or whatever that is. Well, um, Aptera is starting manufacturing in Carlsbad. They moved up from University City. So we have the, the buildings. We just filled them with the wrong things. Um, first off, please do not improve North River, improve North River Road. That is growth inducing. Uh, Citro is horrific sprawl, but at least it's on I-15, which by the way was stopped today with 11 lanes across. So it, there's no way that that ever works. Um, airport residents are complaining about the airport. It's protected by the FAA, so I don't think they'll get anywhere, but our farmland is not as protected. I do own 100 acres in New Mexico, 20 of which are under a conservation easement in a mountainous area. It works beautifully. And I also have more in my family trust. So I understand land. I understand I'm not going to make money. My dad bought it many years ago. It was worthless then. It's worthless now. We, you are not guaranteed to make money. So I think we need to take that off the, the plate. You need to plan and plan for the future. And we're not, we're not here to manage somebody's pocketbook. I raised three kids near Oceanside High School, just blocks away. So kids live in apartments. They live in urban areas. And, and not expensive single family homes. They're not in these suburban neighborhoods. There's a few, but not like it used to be. Um, we are the urbanized area. Many of us here live very close to many of these streets and we want the SS, S, SCP. It is the right answer. We meet all the RINA goals without Morro Hill and Morro Hills won't be affordable. These will be affordable. The density on our major streets saves open space. We're not talking about it leaking into the neighborhoods. It's on our major streets. That also solves the commercial strip mall problem. That's why our commercial areas, the Dunkin' Donuts, the car wash, what a mistake on Oceanside Boulevard. Um, it would have been better to have an apartment building right there and uh, densify Port Fraser Farms. So to summarize, we just need traffic calming in our neighborhoods. That's all we need there. Um, and putting density on our major streets is the answer for last mile issues, for affordability, for the kids, for the open space. It solves so many problems. So the Smart and Sustainable Corridors program by itself saves neighborhoods because we're not rezoning any neighborhoods. We know about ADUs. I'm already surrounded. That's nothing new. Um, it eliminates the last mile problem, which is the problem with a lot of affordable housing and mass transit. And it meets all of our goals. I have a son who wants to live in an urban area here, and he can't afford downtown. And you know, it's not going to work for him to commute now to Carlsbad. So he's coming up from University City. So please support option B, I believe it is, that's just the Smart and Sustainable Quarters program. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Daniel Dominguez, followed by Aaron Morin. Daniel. Good evening, commissioners, staff. Uh, my name is Daniel Dominguez. I'm a 20-year uh, resident of South Morro Hills. Um, I have a couple of concerns. I, I read the project or the alternatives, and I have some concerns regarding uh, alternatives A and C, the addition of additional housing, and also the installation of sewers, uh, the majority or probably mo all of the houses on South Morro Hills are all on septic systems. And my understanding is with the additional bills, some of the residents will be forced to connect to a sewer system and the costs will be borne by the, by the homeowner. Um, there's a lot of retired people up at South Morro Hills. Uh, I know some of them probably could not afford the additional costs. Um, additionally, I think it's a little premature uh, to be talking about adding additional homes to South Morro Hills, especially since my understanding is the North River Farms project is still an open item. It hasn't been resolved. Uh, my understanding it's in litigation. And I looked at the alternatives and nowhere was there any kind of analysis done as to what the impact would be with the additional housing and then also the addition of the units and the hotel, I think, in North River Farms. Um, it is adding homes, and then if with North River Farms, if the project does go through, uh, you would change the character of the South Morro Hill area from open 
agricultural to basically sprawl. Um, so alternative B is the only option that maintains the status quo. I think it makes sense if we're going to go with one of the alternatives to maintain the status quo until we resolve what happens with North River, North River Farm. Thank you very much. Thank you. Last uh, registered speaker here, Aaron Morin. Oh, um, do I do over? Over? Yeah. Boom. This picture was taken two years ago. Um, about two years ago, I do believe. Um, this is when we had our major fire in our area, and the smoke was going up into my house. And I was calling 911. My mom was figuring out if the house was on fire, and I was trying to calm her down and say, Mom, nothing, nothing's going on here. And that is where when we had... Um, our neighbor, unfortunately, had a homeless person on his property, and, well, the homeless person didn't quite cooperate. So, anyways, uh, to let you know, it took over two hours before a fire truck ended up in Morrill Hills because there was another fire in another area. And now the city council is talking about, are we going to have enough firemen to even go with the inclusive population. And if city council is trying to figure that out, think about what's gonna happen if we have those cluster hounds and this goes on and fire still doesn't show up in two to three hours. You will have a burning inferno on your hands. And next thing you know it, you have, you, the, the massive problem is that we've gotta start at is Vandergriff um, uh, Vandergrift, North River Road, and 76 College, you name it, they, at 5 o'clock at night, if their reverse 911 happens, you've got four and a half hours of traffic in front of you just to get out. Now, if you want a repeat of that, and, you, and if this happens and we, we still have, we're still under understaffed with fire, uh, you, you've got a problem, ladies and gentlemen, and I don't think we need cluster homes. I think we just need, need a plan out right now. This, this is the future, and the wind is three times windier than what's down below. In my area, the wind is more harder. It blows a lot faster. That's climate change. That's, that's not nothing, nothing new here. I've, I've lived in this since I was a baby. I've been here. I, yes, and I am a large farmer. But I know what the indications are. My father taught me what the indications are for, for building out there. It's serious. This is no joke. This is, this is reality. This is part of climate change we're going to have to deal with. And this is the main issue that people were bringing up at the workshop. How the heck do we get out? And, Bob, and if we thank, weren't thank you. going to evacuate, we would have to go to Fallbrook or Bonzel. Thank you for your comments. On Sleeping Indian. So just to let you know. Scott, you said that was our last speaker? Uh, yes, that's the last one with a slip. So if, if you didn't submit a slip and you still want to come up before we uh, close out the discussion, come on up. Arlene. Thank you, Mr. Rosales, Tom. Um, I've been following development issues in Southmore Hills for over seven years now. And the reason that I do is personal. My father 
One of the reasons he had to sell our 240-acre farm in Riverside County was rising property taxes because housing developments and houses were going in near and there was speculation. Even with Williamson's Act 10-year coverage, most of you will know what I'm talking about there, <clears throat> housing developments <clears throat> near farmland increases property taxes, reducing profit, profit for farmers. It results in more development and more less farming. Um, the, I just want to remind you, too, that the Planning Commission is to be the liaison between representing the public and liaison improving staff's work, not rubber stamping it based on public input, improving what staff gives you. It's important to note that a small group of large farmers have had the ear of staff for, yes, 12 years, as referenced earlier, prior to the general plan update efforts. What is presented to you here and is not smart growth. Cluster housing is not smart growth, North River Farms wasn't smart growth. Our planning department even said that. Development in smart corridors will meet our housing number requirements. There's no need for additional housing in South Morrow Hills, not even clusters. As you've heard before, what's proposed here conflicts with approved general plan update elements the Energy Climate Action Plan, and the housing element. I can't, and then, there were 10 or more public questions asked at the last, the only real public workshop, which was just 10 years, 10 days ago, seems like 10 years. Um, I'm not gonna try to waste my time focusing in on that. But those questions have not been answered to the public. They are not publicly available. So I'm recommending that before you make a recommendation to city council, those questions get answered and be made easily available to public. And frankly, I don't think there should be any Southmore Hills transfer development rights. They should only be transferred to smart growth and the court transportation corridors. We don't need housing. Thank you. Any more than what can be provided already. And like I said, it's personal. Yes, it is. Thank you. Thank you, Arlene. Okay, last call for the public's input. Okay. Apologies, but I need to go to the restroom. So we're going to take a five-minute break, and then we'll come back and tackle all the different issues you we we heard. So five-minute recess. All right. I think that was five minutes, so we're going to get started again. Okay, Russ. Where to start? I know you took a lot of notes. I took a lot of notes. And there were a lot of questions and references. Um, I can start, or you can uh, maybe touch on some of the, maybe we can do this by themes. I think we heard a couple of repeat items. Um, maybe um, you can touch on a couple of those as a start. Um, so or I can start said, plucking through my notes. Uh, as you said, Chair Rosales, um, a lot of good input. Um, I'm processing that. It would, it would help me, I think, to have the commission sort of reflect back some of that comment uh, with their questions, and I can be responsive to that. Okay. Well, we start there. Um, and for the new commissioners, uh, your your little screen here allows you to 
chime in and uh, request to speak. So if you could use that feature here. So um, Louise, why don't you start us off? I would just like you to first state that this meeting tonight is a discussion item only from what you was stated in the public record that we're not voting on anything. So is that true? Because I know in my a staff report, that's what it said. And one of the um, uh, community members stated that. And I know that when I looked at it, it said um, staff presentation, public comments, discussion and comments by planning commission. No action will be taken by the commission. So is that true, or that's the first, my first question to you is brought up by the community also. Is it voting, or is it just a discussion? Commissioner Balma, as um, I established early in my presentation, we are asking for Planning Commission direction on these alternatives. Uh, we are making a recommendation, and that is for Alternative C as the preferred plan for the general plan update. And we are going to ask you to vote. Hmm. Uh, Okay. on an alternative, and I, and I want to point out that um, this is fluid, and that, um, you know, I appreciated the, the comment, I think, from Ms. Hammerschmidt about um, the commission being able to add value to, to the conversation and um, perhaps the direction uh, that we're going. So uh, as you look at these three alternatives, you may find you like some aspects of them and dislike other aspects of them. Um, so, you know, one outcome here could be some modification of one of the alternatives. Even something. Well, can I just go? Yeah. The other, the other thing I different. thought maybe you could help us with is there's some uh, comments that were made from the community that that aren't in the. Uh, it's this is just mostly referenced in the South Moy Hills community plan, such as. Um, the density bonus cannot occur in agricultural land because it's zoned agriculture. So that means that a density bonus project could not occur in Southmore Hills. That's what I was told. Is that like that's one of my questions to clarify? The other one was the infrastructure has always been said that and that's sewers, roads, whatever happens during a, a project's development, whether it's agritourism or whether it's clustered housing or whatever, would be paid for by the developer, not the community. That that should be clarified. Um, let's see. What was the other question I had? Mm. Oh, well, that this is that, those are just probably main two different things I can just pull up right now. My little crappy little no, notes. No, and those here. those are <laughs> those are good ones, and I had those too. Okay. But maybe as a starting point for me, maybe I'm okay. being dense tonight. But the discussion, I don't think there's any any question that I think people are supportive of development in the corridors. I think everybody's thinking that makes sense. Why are we linking, and maybe you can explain this, why are we linking that development, which seems to be acceptable with um, the development cluster, whatever term you want to use, uh, South Morrow Hills? Is that because if we don't do that, and I'll borrow Mr. Obama's um, idea, if, if I got it right, if we don't do that, then any future development out there could be sort of the Wild West and so we want to develop some standards on how we develop South Moore Hills, because it is going to happen, I, I think. So do we control it by this means, or do we segregate just the corridor development as a standalone and South Moore Hills as a, as a separate exercise, if you will? And again, if I'm being dense and I don't get all that, uh, I apologize, but I, I want to understand that better. Chair is always uh, not dense at all, very germane. Following uh, its decision on the North River Farms project, the city council directed staff to prepare a community plan for the South Morrow Hills area to address the potential of similar projects coming forward in the future. And well, they didn't do this formally, um, informally they established uh, a moratorium on uh, applications for um, general plan amendments, zone amendments, um, like North River Farms um, in the Ag District. So this was established as a city council priority um, through that action. We were in the process of initiating the second phase 
um, of the general plan update. We thought it appropriate, given the general plans are supposed to look at the city holistically uh, and the full dynamic, uh, we thought it appropriate to address the community plan as a component of the general plan update so that we could address all aspects of the project, including the South Moore Hills Community Plan in one environmental document. That would be um, a cohesive approach that would allow us to really look at how um, all impacts associated with all components of the project um, can be addressed, can be mitigated. Um, so that's you know, fundamentally um, where uh, that direction came from. Um, I do think that the expectation was that a plan would provide some certainty um, going forward mm. as to what um, is possible in South Moore Hills and perhaps what is not. Okay, no, that, that helps a lot, thank you. So then let's tackle one of Louise's questions, which I had on my own as well. Density bonus, so say development occurs in this same manner as uh, if we make that recommendation, alternative C or density bonus in that development out there, that cluster development in South Moro Hills, again, if this goes forward, how does that, does that look different? Do we, do we not allow that to happen? We put a different standard in. Again, if, if, we do, if our hands are tied because of state law, do we have that allowance to be able to do that differently out there? Or does that become an issue as well? What I can say, Chair Rosales, is that we would intend, um, and I should make the point that the community plan uh, would be a policy document that would provide direction for standards that would likely be established in Article 14 of the zoning ordinance. Uh, you'll remember the Tier 1 Ag Tourism uh, Zone Amendments uh, that were adopted, recommended by this body and adopted by the City Council um, several years ago. The thought is that um, the South Moore Hills Community Plan would again inform changes to our zoning standards. We do not at this point contemplate changing the land use or zoning designation of South Moore Hills. We would maintain the ag zoning designation. There may be some allowances um, per the policy framework uh, for housing, for tier two agritourism, for infrastructure, mm. um, but we would not change the underlying land use and zoning designations. Now, whether that would, whether that would protect this area from state density bonus, I don't have a clear answer to that question. I don't know if our um, hmm. city attorney is in a position to speak to that or our city planner, but I, it, I don't know to what extent it remains an open question. Um, Chair Rosales, members of the Planning Commission, that's a fair and kind of a dense question. Um, generally, my understanding of uh, Government Code Section 65915, what constitutes the state density bonus law, is, is allowable for any residential development project that has four more units, and maybe four more units, I have to verify the number of units, but it has a, prescribes a minimum number of units that produces that results in housing. And so it begs the question, could a density bonus project be applied um, under the framework of an adopted South Moore Hills community plan? We'd have to look into that a little bit deeper. My initial understanding of uh, density bonus law tells me that it could be allowed. Um, so we have to dig into that a little bit more. Okay. And, and if, I guess a corollary of that would be, if, if that were true, then that would mean that it's it's something that a developer could invoke today. So if you're keeping tabs for us, and you know, if we're gonna make a recommendation to the city council, that would be something I would suggest that we get some clarification on. I think we're gonna to try to provide you kind of a summary of points to bring to the city council. I think that's one of them. I don't wanna hog the conversation here, so any other commissioners? Uh, Louise, did you still had your, your hand up. Uh, I could let somebody else talk and then I can come circle back if they don't cover something. I mean. I could take the opportunity to respond to Commissioner Balma's question about infrastructure and, and, and costs associated with okay. that. And, and then be Commissioner Hayes will come to you after that. Go ahead. So it was uh, established 
um, at a discussion of the uh, vision um, with the city council um, in the fall of last year that the um, city staff would work uh, with water utilities um, to address uh, language um, in code that speaks to a requirement to connect to new um, water infrastructure if it is going across the front edge of a property that is not connected, um, in this case to sewer. And uh, in those discussions we've concluded and the Water Utilities Department concurs um, that the city would not require existing homeowners on septic to connect to new sewer if it were provided. Okay. The cost of that system would be borne um, by developers, by property owners pursuing development. I think it is a legitimate question to ask how does long-term maintenance of such infrastructure get financed? And that's probably something we should address in the community plan. Great, thank you. Commissioner Hayes. I, I was just curious about, I know right now the underlying zoning allows for one residential unit for every two and a half acres. So the underlying is residential. With the agritourism plan, what would that be changed to under the cluster proposal under alternative C? Commissioner Hayes, are you asking if there would be a, a different um, land use or zoning designation assigned? for those uses? Yes, yeah, so if you yeah. were clustering housing, trying to cl put those, I mean, right now, doing the math, I mean, just simply, if you have 3,500 acres out there, you could potentially build 1,400 homes. So if you're clustering it with the intent of capping the number of homes, um, in my mind, that means that you're probably going to rezone the rest of it something else so that more housing couldn't occur. Has there been a thought as to what that additional zoning would be and if that would protect possibly against uses for affordable housing that might over might be able to occur right now under the residential zoning. Yes, yeah, so our, our first thought again is to maintain the ag land use and zoning designation across South Mara Hills, not change that, um, provide potentially allowances um, for clustering again in exchange for a minimum of 75% of the holding. Um, and we're not at this point certain what the vehicle would be for the conservation of the farmland, but that would be the exchange essentially. Um, the ability to cluster um, would involve um, an, an agreement of some kind that preserves 75% of that holding as farmland. Um, we do think, given that, as you pointed out, um, it is an ag district now that allows housing, that there's uh, nothing that would preclude us or require us essentially to change the underlying land use or zoning to accommodate um, the policy framework that would allow for clustering. Does that get at your question? Yes, it does, but I think ultimately what um, I, I think a lot of us would like to see if that's allowed is some kind of, you know, whether it's a land preservation, whether it's designated open space or designated farmland, it cannot be developed with housing or any other uses. I see what you're saying. So would there be vehicles other than, say, a conservation easement or a restrictive covenant that would protect that land? Would it be worthwhile to look at a land use and zoning designation that would um, that would further um, support um, that conservation. Um, I, I, I think on some level we've anticipated that by again maintaining over the entire area um, the ag zoning as the principal land use um, in that area. A question uh, for you. I did a little research on uh, conservation easements and or trusts, whatever you want to call uh, those sorts of uh, preservation type of vehicles. Um, are, is it what I didn't find in my research? Maybe you can help me out with this. Is 
the uh, who drives that? Is it is it typically a partnership between a municipality or a county and or the private land developers? Is it just the private or owners, or is it just the owners, or can it be sort of a mix of anything? Chair Rosales, typically it's something that occurs in conjunction with new development as a form of mitigation. So in the county of San Diego, there is the PACE program. And the PACE program is a means by which uh, development can mitigate impacts uh, on farmland by purchasing uh, ag easements, uh, conservation easements on other ag property um, within the county. Um, in terms of the, the, the cost uh, of those transactions and, and kind of the market viability of uh, acquiring as ag easements, what we're finding in consultation with the folks who run the PACE program, with folks who run the SALK program, uh, which was mentioned by one of our speakers, um, we did commit in the Climate Action Plan to um, pursue um, ag easement acquisition through the SALK program. We've learned a lot about the challenges of acquiring property through the, the SALK program. Um, but what we're hearing is that the, the zoning um, of ag properties uh, and the allowances under that zoning um, greatly determine uh, the value of, of any ag easement. So in the county of San Diego and backcountry areas where you have ag designations like A20, A40, A80, meaning one dwelling unit per 20 acres, one dwelling unit per 40 acres, one dwelling unit per 80 acres, it's a lot easier to acquire um, ag easements um, because those farmers um, have no expectation of any other uh, land use. Uh, on those properties, and so why not? Why not accept um, ten thousand dollars per acre uh, to continue doing what you're doing, and and continue doing essentially the only thing you're allowed to do um, with that property? The dynamics very different in South Morrow Hills with the residential allowance and the value of the property that that residential allowance um, conveys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's true. Now, ag easements are pursued proactively by land trusts. They have to have willing um, property owners. Right. Just to throw in a tidbit on that cost for agricultural land in Southmore Hills, uh, we just had a lot that sold for three fifty. No, no house. So an ag easement of $10,000, I don't think anybody in South Moore Hills, unless it was land that was not been able to perk possibly with a septic or something, would even entertain the fact of selling your land for $10,000. No farmer, I don't think, would do that, that, mm -hmm. that I know of. I mean, all the farmers in South Moore Hills are farming. Every one of them is still successful and doing, and doing pretty good. They're just worried about what happens in 10 years from now. As, as we met, was mentioned tonight, the water is very expensive. Um, it's getting to the point where like someone like myself, who we have, ag we have agricultural land, we, we, we uh, grow avocados, we're at the point now where we're pretty much paying to play. We're, we're paying to be a farmer. And there's a lot of people like me, not many, but that still continue to, to pay for the water, to pay for the labor and the upkeep of our land because we want to farm. It's like a passion. It's like a love. Um, but a lot of people that move into South Moore Hills, just in my one little proximity, about a mile around me, most people that buy the two and a half acre house, whatever, um, have turned it into like one guy just emptied out all of his storage containers and it's just a bunch of stuff <laughs> all over his property. Another guy's parking semi trucks and trailers. And then another one's turning into a commercial business, which I don't think is legal, but it's like things like that are happening. People are buying you know, South Moore Hills property and not doing agriculture, they're doing just, I'm gonna use this land for just, you know, something, you know, I can sprawl out on. And uh, we did have one though, one good person that actually put money back into their trees that were dying 
And they both have good jobs, good paying jobs, and they ended up using their money to fund. Uh, they want to do a you pick kind of operations, but it's not making money. It's, again, a labor of love. It's love to, to be able to preserve that two and a half acres and make a you pick operation for agritourism. They just got the passion of it. But you don't get many people that can afford to do that. I mean, we all know Jason Mraz lives out there, right? Well, he also pays to grow. <laughs> he doesn't make money on his farm. He makes money, but he doesn't make money to pay for what his costs are. He does it out of love. So um, that's kind of where we're at with this whole you know, idea of what can we do in South Myra Hills to make this pencil out, to make this work, to make it not turn into like houses like North River Farms. That was an cr incredibly awful thing that happened to all of us out there. We were in the process at the time of trying to come up with a plan our own little association and our landowners, and when that just plopped right into our laps and, and, uh, and got voted in by the city council, even though the planning commission and the planning staff were very passionately against it, it still went through, and it's still in litigation, as we know, but who knows what's going to happen. The end result probably is going to be North River Farms. So that's, kind of, that's why we're here. That's where we're trying to figure out a plan that will somehow hold water, that we won't get another plan, development plan ever in my lifetime, I hope, I don't ever want to see another one of those land in our, la in our laps. It was too much of a fight. It's cost too much money. There's a lot of people out there that have spent a lot of their time out there fighting this, and I don't want to fight it ever again. We just got to come up with something that works. And a lot of people say in our workshop on March 16th, it's true. All of us said we want agritourism, and I personally feel the same way. I would love to see boutique hotels and cafes and wineries and all this great stuff. But what we're finding out from all the studies is that we need to have infrastructure in order to have this. In order to get infrastructure, we need to have some kind of housing that pays for infrastructure. This is what, I'm not a developer. This is what I'm told that this is how the process works. So we, that's where we got this clustered idea. And the, and the idea of where did 7525 come from? It came from Temecula. That's exactly what they do. They did it 75% vines and 25% the building you see with the winery or the hotel. So we thought that was a good plan. We studied it. We uh, talked to the counties of Riverside and figured out how they did it all before we even presented it to the city staff. And they've taken it over, and you guys have studied it with Kaiser Marson. So we've you know, gotten to that point. So I'm kind of rambling. I'll let somebody else talk. <laughs> no, appreciate that. Any more rambling by anybody? <laughs> I'll just add to the rambling that this is the whole reason why I even wanted to be on planning commission was moving into Arrowwood and dealing with North River Farms and the fire and not being able to evacuate my neighborhood. Um, and there are so many, I, I wish that more of my neighborhood would come out and talk to the issues here. We love the farms behind us. Um, they're beautiful. But what happens if they can't afford to be maintained and those trees start dying and it puts it at us at even a greater fire risk and we're adding more homes back there? I mean, that's a big concern. We know Melrose Extension got deleted, which means the bridge will probably never get built. We don't have another way out. So, and then one other thing I'm gonna say, which is really not relevant completely, <laughs> but down Douglas, they put this raised median and I don't understand why they put a raised median down Douglas when it's one of our only escapes out of the neighborhood. With that raised median, it, it limits the capacity of cars if you wanted to do contraflow. So <laughs> just think through these things. Okay. No, I think that's, that, that's a good talking point. I mean, again, I'm, I'm putting notes here and trying to remember a thing. That's something. So I, I think if I could capture kind of what uh, Commissioner Hayes said, we need to address the issue. If, if cluster housing development is going to happen out there, we heard fire, we heard traffic, uh, we heard infrastructure. Those need to be talking points with the city council as, as we, if, if we recommend this go forward, whatever alternative, that, that needs to be vetted completely and everything because those are recurring themes. Um, Another huge one is right to farm. How can we put more houses in South Morro Hills and have more people complain about, as one person came here and said, pesticides, fertilizers, all those things that commercial farmers use? Commercial farmers are in business. And the way that the world spins right now, I think it's like 1.5% of the total farmland is, is organic right now. And even in the U.S., it's maybe about 1%. So it's not a lot of people can do organic farming because, again, it's a labor of love. It's, it's really expensive to do. So you can't expect our farmers in South Morro Hills to convert to, like, organic. 
And so they're gonna stay commercial farming and they use everything that they use out there has been vetted by the government. And you might not believe the government. There's always gonna be a study that says somebody got some kind of asthma condition based on some dust or whatever they're, they're breathing. But, but it's been vetted just like all of the medications we take. So you have to kind of trust some kind of science and that's kind of what the science we work with. And every farmer out there follows the rules and does it by the book because they can't afford to have any lawsuits or any problems from their neighbors. But the more people you put out there, the more people are gonna complain. And that's where the right to farm part of this whole idea of the South Hills Community Plan has to be completely, I hope, strong. I don't know, Barbara, I mean, is there any kind of legal way you can actually tell someone that when they move out to Southmore Hills, there's gonna be pesticides, herbicides, dust, tractors, trucks, all kinds of helicopters spraying. There's, that's just what we have out there. And now we only have 150 people to live out there and we all love it and we understand it and we're fine with it. But you put in North River Farms and what do you think that's gonna do? That's gonna change, because they're not gonna have any kind of right to farm anything. They're just gonna be moving in and just saying, what the? <laughs> so I, you know, that's gotta be really strong in our Southmore Hills Community Plan is the right to farm. I mean, I've, I've got so many, you know me. <laughs> That's right. We'll try to summarize all this okay, at summarize. the end with... Well, I with. have a question about that. Would, that'll have to be in all of the disclosures, with the real estate disclosures, right. and right. then it would be there's no way around it, right? Right. They move in. So they'll have to live with it once they send the disclosure. Okay. I'm going to switch gears just momentarily to the industrial uh, land conversion or uh, that we talked about in, in the... Um, in the corridors. So the concept there would be to look at opportunities for converting existing industrial uh, lands to opportunities for additional housing, correct? Let's say, um, let's say mixed use mixed with, use. A, with okay. a robust okay. um, commercial component. And so the two areas, um, Chair Rosales, would be again, south side of Oceanside Boulevard, west of RDO, east of El Camino Real. Um, I mentioned the uses that exist there today. Um, this is an area located between two sprinter stations mm -hmm. um, with land uses that provide um, not, not a lot of employment um, density. Yeah. Uh, and then the other area would be a portion of the north side of Industry Street mm -hmm. uh, from in, where Industry tees into Oceanside Boulevard, eastward to Garrison, where um, uses there... There are a variety of uses, um, but generally um, are very low um, employment density uses. There are yards, contractor yards, uh, utility yards, things of that sort. So um, one, one thought is that um, with that kind of change, uh, you could achieve more compatibility with land uses on the opposite side of Oceanside Boulevard. You go across Oceanside Boulevard and that's residential. Um, you may also has, have an opportunity um, on Industry Street itself um, to complete that street. And as we look at the Inland Rail Trail and come to the conclusion largely that um, the opportunity to place that rail trail in the Sprinter right-of-way is very limited. That right away itself is limited. There are hydro hydrological challenges. Uh, there are uh, habitat um, issues there. It, uh, that probably forces the uh, inland rail trail into the public right of way, mm -hmm. existing public right of way. So, if there are opportunities to take the inland rail trail off of Oceanside Boulevard and maybe extend it down industry from El Camino Real to um, to South Oceanside Boulevard. Um, we might have an opportunity as part of the redevelopment of that north side of industry to implement that trail to, to really make that um, parallel corridor, ancillary corridor, um, pedestrian and bike friendly as well. Well, I, I'm supportive of the idea of doing mixed use in, in where there's opportunities in industrial areas, like you explained. I think that's uh, something that should be explored uh, you know, as best as possible. Sure, uh, Morsi. Russ, you had mentioned between um, RDO and El Camino Real on the south side, you've got the landscaping, the block plant, the concrete plant. Can you elaborate on that a little bit, what you're thinking there? So we're contemplating a couple of 
different uh, mixed use designations. Um, one that um, might be more uh, residential um, focused in areas where commerce um, is less likely. And then one that, as I said earlier, um, would uh, require a robust um, commercial component. So, um, you know, the closer you get to a sprinter station, the closer you get to a major intersection, that would, you know, suggest that um, having a, um, a robust, conspicuous commercial component would, would be appropriate there. So in that stretch, and I, offhand, I can't tell you the length of that stretch, but it's, it's quite, you know, it's a fair distance from El Camino Real to RDO, um, we might be looking at different uh, mixed use designations depending on the location of the property and its proximity to one of those intersections or to the Sprinter Station. Commissioner Hayes? Just a follow up on the industrial. Have you talked to any of the industrial landowners back then about where they would go otherwise? And I think the city's recycling facility is back there. Well, I know it is because I make my kid recycle his cans for his allowance. <laughs> and it's messy and it's going to be hard to relocate. So I'm just curious as to where some of these uses would go as we start revisiting what it looks like back there. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Hayes. So our um, recycling facility, if you're referring to our uh, composting uh, operation, our green waste facility. There, no, it's actually, there's cans, bottles, batteries, um, electronic waste. It's off of it's industrial. In, I think it's on Industry Street. Yeah. On, on, you're talking about on industry? Yeah. Gotcha. Oh, yeah. Right. No, you're yeah, you're absolutely right. As part of um I, I dropped off some materials there myself about uh, six weeks ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Um so we we have held forums with property owners um in all of the corridors. Um it may be we may need to do more uh, of that outreach. Um we heard more from commercial property owners than we did from industrial property owners. So it's, it's likely we would have to, um, you know, do some more targeted outreach um, to those uh, property owners and those um, users, those businesses. So just a process question. Since initially this was listed as a discussion item, but now we're, we're making a recommendation or being asked to, um, what's the next step then? Is that just a recommendation to start moving forward with vetting this concept out more? And there'd be more of that outreach that occurs as you get into the finalization of a plan? I'll, I'll respond to that in the context of, of CEQA um, and the environmental review process. As, as I mentioned earlier, the development um, of alternatives is, is meant to uh, foster discussion like, like we've had tonight. And it's also meant to address a requirement uh, under state law to explore alternatives uh, and, and look at the potential environmental consequences of those alternatives. So I don't know if this provides any solace to um, some of our community members, but um, we would be looking to study the alternatives before you tonight um, those alternatives may evolve um, as part of this discussion, as part of the discussion with the city council, but those alternatives would be presented uh, in the environmental document. And when that comes before this body for a recommendation and before the city council for a, a final adoption, those options would be presented there. So there may be a preferred alternative, but there would be other alternatives to choose from. And we saw this with the Coast Highway uh, uh, incentive district, right, and the corridor study where, the, where an alternative other than the one recommended by staff um, was chosen. So I think it's, I think it's, it's fluid in that regard in that um, making a recommendation, say this evening, for a preferred plan doesn't foreclose the potential that another alternative, as we go through the process and address some of the specific concerns expressed by this body and by our community um, could could result in other alternatives uh, being being more favored. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, is it possible? I mean, as a recommendation, that we could request co-equal analysis of all three alternatives if we didn't feel comfortable recommending one. 
I'm thinking about the, uh, the implications of that in terms of timing, in terms of cost. Um, it, it may be a situation where potentially we're in pretty good shape budget-wise. Uh, we've been very efficient in our expenditures to date, but uh, it's, it's possible that that could significantly increase the cost of that component of the project. So they, there might need to be a commitment on the part of the city um, for more funding. But you're making a, an excellent point, which is typically alternatives that are not the preferred plan do not receive the same level of environmental assessment that the preferred plan does. So that's a, that's a policy um, mm -hmm. call that uh, is probably above my pay grade, but the, the point is, is um, taken and it's a discussion that we can have. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Simons. Yeah, just a dovetail. To dovetail on that process question was we've scoped the alternatives. We've found three alternatives to take into the CEQA process. Um, and we're being asked to select a preferred alternative prior to doing the full CEQA analysis. So my experience has always been you take the alternatives through CEQA or NEPA, and then you make the decision based on the environmental analysis of the alternatives. You're asking, if, if I understand correctly, you're asking us to, pref to select a preferred alternative that you're gonna dedicate your planning assets to without doing the full CEQA analysis on all of the alternatives, which to me, is, I'm just not familiar with that from an environmental planning perspective. Yeah, and this is, you know, the, this kind of cart before the horse challenge is, is one of the principal challenges in long range planning because you, you um, don't want to make uh, that kind of investment in something that is not gonna be supported by the community or by the decision makers. So, so in these stages, of this project, we need to get some direction on yeah. where we should be going, general direction on where we, we should be going. And these alternatives are meant to um, give you an opportunity to, to provide that direction. But I, I fully appreciate that it's, it's a difficult decision for you to make. It's difficult direction for you to provide given that you don't have all the information. And, and I do appreciate the budget constraints. Um, but by presupposing an alternative and dedicating funding assets to it, don't you then open the city up to litigation after the fact by presupposing before you even went to the need. But that I feel like you might be opening the city up and uh, the city council up by saying, well, we, we didn't dedicate the planning resources to in exploring the full environmental alternatives uh, because we presupposed it before we provided that information. One of the things is will the, be is there project history where we have done this in a CEQA standpoint. I'm more familiar with the NEPA side yeah. of things and not so much CEQA. And I think they're I think they're very similar. Um, but one of the things we we are required to do is is um, identify um, an environmentally um, uh, superior um, option. Um, cities don't have to choose that option. Um, they can make findings of overriding considerations. Uh, they can determine that there are other interests that are served. Um, maybe it's economic development. Maybe it's the provision of housing. Uh, could be any number of things um, that would override a particular environmental um, impact. And so we saw that again. I'm referencing uh, the Coast Highway um, project again, but we we saw that in in that document where we did make findings of overriding considerations where we had impacts that we could not mitigate but determined that that was a reasonable trade-off given what we were going to get. And the city is the lead agency and the city has that discretion. Chair Rosales. Yes. So we've heard a lot tonight. It's getting late. <laughs> so I want to ask the question, are we going to decide that we're going to try to come up with what, I mean, what our document says is one thing that we're not going to make any recommendations. Russ is asking us to do something else. So can we just have an agreement right now? Are we gonna try to do something? And if we are, let's just try to start and work through this, but it's gonna be another hour for us. 
probably to come up with something, or at least a, a good half hour. I think I'm ready to do that, but I, is everybody on that same page? Well, I think we're being asked to recommend to the city council um, an alternative here, uh, an idea. Well, options, with, three options, right? With some additional or, things. Or modifications thereof. Uh, yeah, with some additional modifications or additions. Um, and or further study by staff. There's lots of working variables. Yeah, so, um, and the city council may have their own uh, items. Well, I'd hope so. They, yeah, so, <laughs> but yes, that's, that's what we're asked, being asked to, to. Are we gonna do that? We, we certainly are hoping we can, unless. Then let's get on it. <laughs> Chair Rosales, um, members of the Planning Commission, I could offer the fact that this is a lot of information to consider in one it evening. Is. You've heard a lot of testimony tonight. There's a lot of factors to consider. There's actually some confusion with respect to how it's posted on the, on the agenda and what the staff report actually says. The staff report is actually requesting a formal recommendation uh, to the city council on this. So we apologize for that confusion. This language should have been vetted a little bit closer. That all being said, we don't have to take any action tonight. We can, you can ask us to bring this item back to you. You can give us a list of questions that you want answered before you make that recommendation that we're asking you to make to the city council. And we can um, consider this item again at the next available uh, meeting of the planning commission. And, and, and I, would, I would add that staff is sensitive to the fact that um, there's a lot of momentum with this project right now. So we've presented you with the alternatives report. We're going to present you with the draft uh, Smart and Sustainable Corridors Plan. Soon we had a workshop on the South Marlow Hills area just 10 days ago. Um, only, I, I think today, maybe Friday of last week, did we post a summary of that workshop. I did send you a link today, and I wouldn't even pretend to think that you would have had time to, um, to look at that summary or listen to that recording of, of that workshop, but to the point made by a number of community members, um, there's information out there, there's input out there that you probably haven't been privy to um, that is now available. Um, and should you need, you know, desire more, more time to, to review that, um, that makes sense. Thank you for that offer. Likewise, city planner, go ahead, city or uh, Commissioner Custer. Well, it is a lot of overwhelming information. And in view of that, what you said a few minutes ago, why couldn't we uh, two at a time meet with the city planner, go over more of this, and get detailed in all of our particular questions answered? Uh, Commissioner Custer, members of the Planning Commission, that certainly is something that we can accommodate. Um, we do have a little bit of a time frame that we're look, hoping to, to work within, um, but I think those are meetings that can generally be accommodated fairly easily. If we were to do that, would we have to go through the same form again and listen to all of what we just heard, hear the same thing all over again for two hours, or could we just cut to the chase and... Good point. I, I think we could probably bring back an abbreviated presentation uh, that would summarize. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, I don't know that we can preclude our community members from no, no, uh, no. participating I think, in the public process. No, I process, think we, if we bring back a new item, new information, uh, more analysis, then I think we, we go through another uh, public discussion process like we had tonight. I think that would be um, acceptable, yeah. uh, Chair Rosales. So, um, does uh, do we need to make a motion or to, in what we want to do tonight? And we were going to be asked to do a recommendation. Do we want to do a motion to formalize kind of what we want to do otherwise here? I think that would help give us clear and, and okay. straightforward direction if the Planning Commission made a motion on what they'd like to see the next steps with respect to the alternatives that the, um, you're being asked to consider to make a recommendation on. Okay, for the maker of the motion, I would ask that you try to capture at least some of the things that we've identified that need further analysis or, or staff needs. Can you make, can you I, and I have, a, I have several bullet points here if somebody misses something. So somebody would like to make a motion along those lines? Well, I'll start with making a motion that we meet two at a time with the city planner and go over this in more detail so that we're all up to speed and uh, include things about density, 
Uh, let me look at my notes. And whatever else anyone has to offer. Uh, I don't know where those notes are. And then bring the item back to the commission. And then the bring it back to the, when, our okay. commission. You make it so that, I mean, I want to do some due diligence. I don't know if that, I'm going to go to the city planner, oh. but can you make it so it's... Good idea. With the, yeah, with the option. With the option. Or due diligence. Okay. Yes. With the, I have a lot of questions. Okay. But yes. With I'd the like option, to. perhaps, that commissioners can meet with city planner. Um, to, and to, or staff. Yeah. And or staff. Okay. Not with maybe. the option to meet okay. with the city planner or do our own right, due sir, diligence. Be busy. <laughs> okay. So um, we have a motion that we have a process that includes the option for commissioners to meet with staff and the city planner or not to do some more deal, due diligence on at least uh, one item, and that was density bonus. I'll add to that the uh, preservation vehicle that might be in play for the farmland around there. Right to farm. Right to, right to farm. Um, Transfer de development rights. Utilities. Uh, utilities and infrastructure. And, and also cell industrial. The other thing is like one of the community members brought up, and I know we, we investigated this with the recycled water, but a way to help farmers farm is to try to provide them with a low cost water. Mm -hmm. So that's important. I mean, if you're gonna try to get far, keep farming out in See, South Morales. I think that's key. Well, that's key. Yeah. And if we, we're going to help the farmers, let's yeah. help the farmers. So there's that that we should, and that's I mean, the city council voted for that once before. It's it's we just need to keep that in the forefront of. What do we call that? Well, uh, affordable or whatever affordable water a grant or something. Or I mean, helping a freebie. The but how do you do that? Yeah. How do you how do you how do you define that? But yeah. but I mean that's true. It's it's great for people that don't live in the area that say, oh, we want that to be farming, but e economically, it just doesn't work. I mean, right. farms have to be efficient. So if we're gonna actually do this, then let's make it successful. So somehow we have to, if, is it, and this, boy, you talk about a quagmire, uh, <laughs> Russ. <laughs> I mean, how, <laughs> I don't know how you do this, but if I think that if we wanna ma make this successful, that's what we need to tackle. Cause that is the thing is you gotta make money. I mean. That somehow these farmers got to make money. Right. I mean, how many people are going to be doing this out of out of love? No. They're going to have to do it because they're making money, and and it might and it might be a lost leader at first, but it may take 10, 15 years. But at some point, you know, you build it, they will come. But but how how do you you, you got to have the money to make it sustainable? Right. And if you want to help the farmers. Vice Chair Morsi, on the subject of water and, and the cost thereof, I'm sure that uh, planning staff can work with our colleagues in water utilities to, um, if nothing else, get you some information. Right. Okay. Uh, I think I heard industrial. So more information about the mixed use industrial opportunities. Yes, and I think um, the current vacancy rates of the three different mm -hmm. specific commercial uses, office, retail, and industrial. Okay, and then I had the uh, addressing traffic and fire, the, the, the issue of fire out in uh, that area, and uh, just conceptually maybe with some ideas on how that would be tackled. Um, okay. Did I miss anything? I think that's good. That's good, I think that's really good. Now this probably doesn't go under that category, but is there any way to find out or have a guesstimate of how many farmers wanna to continue to farm out there? or what the residents want. I mean, we heard a lot from all, the all community of, of what they want out there, but what all, do the people that live there want? All of the commercial farmers and nurseries that are out there now are all doing fine. They're all working. Like one, one nursery's got a 20-year lease on the land that he's on. So it's not like they're gonna go away anytime soon. This is just some kind of plan that we can put on the land that we won't get another PD plan like North River Farms on the first farmer that wants to throw in the towel. <laughs> We don't want that again. We just want to get up something that's going to hold water, that's going to work. And right now, the two and a half acres spread out all over the land with no option to cluster any of that development to make it more affordable to be able to build is not working. It didn't work. So, right. Okay. The one other question is about the affordable housing. Is, uh, is that land currently protected from having major high density affordable housing projects built on it. 
Okay. So there's a lot there, and apologies, but uh, I think we want to make a good informed decision at the end of this. So those are the things we identify we need more information on. <laughs> okay, so we have a motion with all that captured in there. Staff, is that enough? Uh, <laughs> is that enough? Yeah, I think it's enough. So they want more. Uh, <laughs> Um, second, second but I mean, in terms of direction, is that sufficient at this point in terms of the, the process for sort of the next steps? I think so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I, and again, um, the, the idea of, of uh, meeting um, in small groups, um, I think is a, a, an excellent idea as an option. And I think this list um, gives us some to do's to pursue information, um, and, and, and that may be as much as, you know, we can provide. Um, yeah, we may get to the same point where we're being asked to, to push forward a recommendation, but at least I think the sense here would be that we've vetted everything to the degree that we can, and we should feel at that point, I think, at least somewhat comfortable that we've made. And what's the timeline? Point. When are we going to try to get back in? I think it's probably two too too aggressive if we try to say let's bring this back to the next planning commission so maybe two meetings from now would that work uh chair was asked, so that would mean uh, the meeting on april 25th is what you're looking at oh, yeah we'll say that because maybe that'd be we great can delay it. and then russ if you could summarize all that and get that back to us so we know what we're doing <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this evening? <laughs> now? Well, right after yeah. this. So, so what I have is um, assessment of TDR, um, of a, a better understanding of how um, in, in the alternatives can be studied <laughs> under the environmental document. You know, mm -hmm. and do we have the wherewithal to study each alternative that we arrive at um, as thoroughly as what might ultimately be the preferred uh, alternative? Um, density bonus uh, and its applicability in South Morrow Hills. Um, uh, necessary infrastructure, I think particularly for, are we talking uh, for tier two um, agritourism uses? Um, and I think we've addressed and, and answered the question about whether um, there would be a requirement for existing property owners to right. connect well, to that infrastructure. We've got that covered. Um, but I, I don't know that we've answered the question as to um, the long-term uh, maintenance costs of that infrastructure and, and, and who would bear those costs. Um, the vehicle by which um, ag land would be conserved. Um, fire risk. And what I um, understand, Chair and, and um, Commissioners, is that uh, we've been waiting for some time for updated um, fire um, hazard mapping. Um, that is forthcoming, uh, but we've been hearing that it's forthcoming for, for months oh, wow. now from yeah. CAL FIRE. Um, but we certainly can present to you the information that we do have uh, and where high severity um, fire risk is, exists per the existing mapping in South Morales. Okay. And we'll engage our uh, fire department uh, in this discussion. Uh, right to farm and what that means and how that's established. Um, and whatever information we can provide about the provision and cost of water. Yep, that, that's great. Thank you. Is it, do you have to second the motion? Uh, yeah. So we had a motion with all that detail. That I'll great. second. And we now have a so motion by Commissioner Custer, second by Commissioner Hayes. Um, and so yeah, I think we're ready to vote. Unless okay, we're, we're voting. Go ahead. Mr. Dodds, did you press? Yes. <laughs> Chair Rosales, let the record show that uh, unanimous vote to continue this item to the meeting on April 25th with those uh, questions to be um, answered by staff for the Planning Commission's information. Thank you, City Planner. Thank you, Russ. Yes. For bearing with us. Thank you. Good job. And I have one more question. So, will this still go to City Council on 
at their next meeting, or will they will it be removed? Commissioner Custer, no, this item will wait for a recommendation from this body before we take it forward it to wait. City Council. Okay. Let me ask who's the right meeting. Okay. We, let's ask them to change the meeting. Let me get to that real quick. Okay. Um, okay, so we're at uh, that time in the agenda. We're talking about city planner commission reports. So um, I will start um, city planner. I'm going to be out for the next meeting, the, the 11th, as is Vice Chair Morrissey. We're going to the same place. So in terms of procedure, in terms of running the meeting, um, what what happens in that instance? I think we'll still have a quorum unless somebody's missing, but. Uh, so Chair Rosales, uh, members of the Planning Commission, uh, fortunately there's no items scheduled for the meeting on April that's, 11th. So that's even better. Because I don't want to miss it. <laughs> so this is the last one? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to stop my commissioner's report and then um, I, I think turn it over to Commissioner Hayes because I know she sent us all an email earlier today and I don't want to I don't want to be the announcer. So Jolene, do you want to? Well, after tonight's discussion, I'm almost thinking of just sticking around for two more weeks. But <laughs> <laughs> I am moving to Nebraska, so um, it just yeah, it's it's not until the end of May, but um, a lot to do with moving a bunch of kids across the country. So, um, yeah, so I really want to stick around for the next one, but I might just come as a resident and, and speak to it unless. Well, your term is, or your, 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 around. your stick around can be as long as you want it to be. Yeah. Um, I know you put in a. Yeah, plus we have to we have to go out afterwards. Yeah. Oh, That's yeah. what I'm thinking. I mean, I, yeah. you not yeah. being here next time. Okay, I, I will. There you go. If that's we'll okay, I would like to. I'll, I'll send a new email just yeah. saying that I will stick around until the 25th. Then. If you could send a, a, a follow up email to the last one you sent, uh, we'll, we'll use that date. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to have you stick around. Um, that's it. I ha that's all I have for um, report. Uh, Vice Chair Morsey. I sent out something that I got from uh, a resident on tournament about a tree being cut down, and I sent that to Sergio and Barbara, and I, I sent that a copy to you. Did you guys get that today? Okay. Um, yeah, don't recall and, getting any emails from me. Pardon. I don't recall getting any emails okay, from so you. Okay, so in a nutshell, um, there was a pepper tree that was cut down across the street from 3317 uh, Tournament, and the resident is uh, Don and Denise Montable. And if, if you'll indulge me, I just, I'll, I'll find it and I'll read it to you real quick, but because it is quick. Um, Uh, dear Commissioner Morrissey, as a resident who lives on Tournament Drive on Oceanside, I would like to bring to your attention the sudden and unnecessary cutting down of a beautiful, fully mature pepper tree on Tournament Drive. In the past, the pepper tree in question has been trimmed without city permission by a neighbor resident who lives above it on Caddy Court. Now the tree has been cut down to the stump by the city without proper and transparent ex explanation. No tree replacement has been planted. The ugly stump remains on the hillside. A, very, a few very small ground cover plants have been added to the space, which is totally inadequate. See pictures, and I'll try to send this to you again tomorrow. But <laughs> as you know, as residents of the Pacific Views neighborhood, we pay for the maintenance of the hillside. Therefore, I respectfully request the Planning Commission to exercise their power of oversight and fully investigate the process that was used to arrive at the decision to cut down this beautiful tr this tree down. Furthermore, at the findings of the requested decision, was illegal or result of lack of proper process, I also request the person, people involved and that decision to be held accountable. In any event, this action has re resulted in a blank space where a number of pepper trees existed on the hillside. It has not been properly replaced with another tree. This has been ongoing, an ongoing issue in our neighborhood. 
In the past, some neighbors move in and attempt to personally reshape the organized, long-standing plan established trees in our neighborhood. These residents have been caught trimming and attempting to remove trees for their own personal tastes and view corridors. I appreciate any and all correspondence regarding the facts and decided disposition of this issue as you move forward with your fact finding. And so that's it for me. Uh, Commissioner Morrissey, if you forward that email to me again, yeah. and it may be the size of the attachments or something that- You know what, there were pictures involved. Yeah, that may be. That might be. If you just send me the text, uh, and and then maybe I'll send you a link to to um, upload the uh, okay. pictures. Uh, we'll we'll get over to Public Works and see what they okay. have to say about it. All right, thank you. That's it. Thank thank you, uh, Commissioner Obama. Nothing to report. Commissioner Custer. No report. Commissioner Hayes, anything to add to your announcement? Nothing. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Dodds. Nothing to report. And Commissioner Simons. Nothing to report. City Planner. Briefly, I know it's been a long evening. Um, we have some upcoming items for the Planning Commission on the meeting of April 25th. In addition to continued discussion on the alternatives, we have a, a mixed-use project in the 1900 block of South Coast Highway called the Flats, which consists of um, 18 residential units, approximately uh, 2,700 square feet of retail commercial, and it's a project that is utilizing state density bonus law. Um, on the meeting of uh, May 9th, we have tentatively scheduled uh, an expansion at Tri-City uh, Medical Center uh, for their psychiatric ward. And then three, three of the items that the uh, Planning Commission considered on the, at their meeting of March 14th have been appealed to City Council. Uh, the chem station CEP will be uh, heard by the city council on at their meeting on May 4th. Uh, the Whaley Street residential project will be considered by the city council at their meeting on May 18th. And finally, the um, Cypress Point residential project will be considered by city council at their meeting on June 22nd. Um, that concludes all I have for you today. So we were three for three on that night. <laughs> Okay, um, I think that's it, right? We're adjourned. <laughs>